I always get surprised with a gavel. Um, I'll call this uh, subcommittee of the State Allocation Board together. I'm going to here today to talk about priority and school construction funding. Um, you know, we've actually, because there's only three of us on the committee, we actually, by setting, creating the committee the way we did, um, we are subject to Bagley Keene, and all of us have really respected that, um, the law, obviously, and so we, the three of us really haven't had uh, time to talk about what our end goals are to get out of the, today's meeting. So I thought I'd, I'd just kind of start with sort of what my thinking was, and I had the pleasure of working with the staff on the staff memo that in the subcommittee um, binder, and I think there's copies available back there, and there were copies put online yesterday. Um, basically, what I really want to try to, for me, what I'd like to accomplish today is really having a, uh, a robust discussion on all the issues that are raised in the staff memo and any other issues that all of you um, smart people in the room can bring up and, and have a real conversation about, about this that would include, I would like to try to ask you various testifiers and speakers to questions along the way. Because what I'm really trying to do for me is I haven't personally made up my mind about, I, I raised this issue, obviously you all saw me do it in the meeting and I've brought it forward, but it's, I, I'm somewhat agnostic about what our approach should be if we even should make any changes to our program. I've come in my short amount of time here to appreciate um, having listened to everything everyone said about kind of why we do things the way we do it, the meaning of the list, what how difficult planning school construction has been in these awful times, and I'm sympathetic to all of that. But I also want to make sure that we don't miss we don't miss an opportunity to do something different if if need be in order to meet the goals of the board. And so hopefully we can have a really interactive conversation today. That that's my goal. I had sort of laid out um, the staff and I had kind of worked on these kind of issues for consideration. Um, thank you to Juan who's really taken the lead on this um, and I think what I my suggestion would be and I'd like you guys will have to have this discussion here is um, to kind of go through these one at a time and ask speakers to limit themselves to those issues so that we can really just focus on the pros and cons and the and the and the and the barriers and the impediments um, on each of these kinds of on each of the issues. That was kind of what how I was thinking of approaching this. But I'm open to um, any suggestions on that front. Kathleen Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for me, my, my spin is not unlike yours, but perhaps um, I wasn't a little spinning. <laughs> I'm not spinning. <laughs> Sorry. Didn't mean to use the word if it's offensive. Your goal is not unlike mine, except I have perhaps a more focused interest in that really relates to what the board collectively asked us to do, which was to really analyze option, so-called option three. And I think you have correctly said that there are issues for consideration under those options, and that's really what we should focus on. Having said that, um, I am going to spend most of my time probing on the advantages and disadvantages of proceeding without regulation, because to me this is the right time to do something different. It is the right time to create jobs. We have the opportunity to do something unique, something on a temporary basis, something we can collect data on and then step back from. So I am very interested in hearing about um, that in particular. Having said that, uh, I am one who is very cautious and at times very conservative, and I am going to at some point ask us to consider a parallel track, no matter what we end up doing if we take action. What I mean by that is as much as we may find comfort in moving without a regulation on the off chance that someone down the line uh, wishes to question that, I would strongly suggest we have a parallel track where we move the regulation at the same time so that we don't lose a month, two months, three months if somebody questions an action 
should the board uh, decide to proceed uh, without regulations. Not a fact in evidence. Uh, the three of us can't determine that. But if we're going to be making recommendations to our colleagues for later this month, I'd like to have us consider a dual track. If Thank you, Cynthia, too, for um, allowing us to make an opening remark. And mine would be, um, I'm, I'm the superintendent is remaining open um, to the discussion and to the issues. I think we indicated previously we want to be cautious in terms of precedent setting, but that we are in extraordinary times and that there may be um, some, there, there is a, an objective of this board in entertaining um, a priority uh, funding allocation methodology at this time. And I think what would be important for both the subcommittee and the board is to really um, go through the question or go through the issues. I think they're enumerated nine. I thought they were a nice outlay of the issues. But also in beginning that is to indicate what our real objective is. And um, I for one can state what I think our objective is and then I would ask um, others in the audience and, and with the board um, subcommittee to express those as well. I heard from the board the concern of um, utilizing cash um, in, a, in an efficient manner. And that is one of the objectives, so that we draw down the cash um, in an efficient manner such that we're well poised for any future bond um, sales within the state of California, such that we are not looked at as a program that has a huge um, cash availability that has not been utilized. That is one objective that I have heard from other board members and that I know is, is one that um, we are we are reviewing. The second objective is in our troubled economy creating local jobs and providing um, local communities with the matching sources um, in some instances for 50-50 projects and for hardship projects of creating um, the uh, local, uh, creating the ability to um, move projects forward locally. That is a second objective that I believe of this board. And, and and then third is to um, to look at alternative ways um, with a very cautious eye, I think, is, is what I would say. I have heard our objectives are in entertaining um, a different priority system for $415 million than first in, first out. Okay. Um, Juan, did you want to go ahead and take us through the memo a little bit? Sure. Yeah. And just to, to recap, for, for those that aren't familiar, um, one of the options that we discussed and the board wanted us to further explore was option three. Uh, but to even get into the discussion of option three, I think it's helpful to talk about what is the current process for making apportionments. And the current process for making apportionments is simply the fact that districts and applications, we process them first in, first out, then they get placed on an unfunded list. As bond funds um, become available, then those projects from the unfunded list move into and actually become apportionments. Once an apportionment is made, then they have up to 18 months to draw down those funds and request a fund release. So we presented the board with some options, and option three is a slight twist to, to this process, which basically allows districts to certify through some sort of a preliminary fund release that they can and they will be able to submit a fund release request within a certain amount of time after an apportionment. Uh, the item talked about 60 days, so basically the districts will be able to certify that after 60 days from an apportionment, they will be able to submit a fund release request. And the idea is simply that the board will make an apportionment to projects that are ready to submit a fund release. That's basically the, the, the simple version of option three. Along with that, there were several key issues that the board wanted us to take a look at and address. And I'm going to go through these um, one by one, and then we can go back and perhaps, Madam Chair, go through and, and, and get input on each one individually. 
So the first one is simply regulations. Um, are they necessary? And how long will it take? I think the goal is to implement this process as quickly as possible. So the board wants us to explore whether we need regulations and um, how quickly we can implement this program. We have some information on your packet that um, outlines a budget letter from the Department of Finance that we can take a look at, as well as some other uh, government and ed code sections that may give the board some flexibility. The next issue deals with facility hardship projects. These are our health and safety projects. I think that the board uh, has recognized that there's a need to address some of these facility issues. So questions are, should these projects receive priority? Uh, or should there be a reservation of funds for these type of projects? How do we handle these health and safety issues? Next, we get into financial hardship districts uh, and small school districts. I think uh, staff recognizes that these districts face certain challenges, so we need to take a look to see how do we uh, uh, account for these in terms of do we set another priority for them, do we reserve funds for these types of projects, and part of this conversation, we also take a look at uh, design and site acquisition only apportionments. Do those, should those receive the same type of priority as projects that are uh, construction ready? Uh, so that's another part of the conversation. And then another issue that was brought up was equitable distribution of funds among districts. Should we create a system that allows for um, a lot of districts to, or, or, or more districts to receive grants or, or not. Next is bond source switching. We have limited bond funds in each of the propositions, Proposition 47 namely. So if a district had received an unfunded approval under one bond source, is there an ability to switch bond fund sources? We need to explore that. Uh, reimbursements. There's been some concerns about projects that um, have already been built and should they be able to participate in, in the same priority as other projects and whether we need to require or consider certain um, rules for these type of projects. Uh, next is penalties. Should there be any penalties? We're talking about making certifications that districts can and will submit fund waste requests if they don't what should the resulting penalty be? Um, data collection. The board asked us to take a look and report back with results of this whole process uh, to see if we, um, uh, to reevaluate the, the, the way the process worked. And lastly is a communication plan. How are we going to notify school districts uh, so that they know that they're aware of this new process because we're making some major changes to the way we make apportionments. That's a brief summary of each one of them, um, but um, Madam Chair, if, if you'd like, we can go back through each one of them and get input and have discussion on each one of those uh, items. Let me just ask off the top, did you, is there anything missing that you think, possibly you can think of? Not that I can think of. Does anybody, is any, anybody out here have thoughts about something that's missing from the list that we should put on to talk about? Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead then and, and start with, I don't know, gosh, in some ways I wish number one was number nine on the list. But, uh, Put it last if you Maybe want. we should hold that discussion of how we do this. We should figure out what it is, um, well, what are the possibilities of what we might actually be doing. So maybe we should start with facil facility hardship projects. Okay. We, we currently have about $16 million on the unfunded list for health and safety projects. Um, currently, when we process facility hardship projects, they do receive a priority in processing. They go to the top of each board, um, each month's list. So there's a way for these separate, separate projects, again, because they are having safety issues. So uh, one consideration would be to give them uh, a priority or just have a carve out, have a set aside for these facility hardship projects out of the 450 million. So that's really the question before the subcommittee. Let me just ask a quick question. So the when you on your on the chart you say three point one million on the current OPSC workload. Those are those are facility hardship projects that we are going to add to the unfunded list in May. Yes. So I think that's kind of 
I mean, just a key fact that we have, we do, because we haven't added anything to the unfunded list for a couple months. So there's going to be, when the index comes out and the agenda is posted, there will be a there will be new projects added to that. So I think it's safe to assume for this discussion that whoever gets added in May is eligible for all of this. I wouldn't think we'd treat them differently. It'd be just like we're going to get the list caught up and then from there the, four, the 419 would apply to that list. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, just checking. Okay, and so right, anybody have any thoughts about facility hardship? Like to comment, Scott? The only comment I would have, if the chair agrees, I would uh, certainly encourage um, Ms. Kaplan to chime in on any of these items if she has a thought or recommendation, and then we can hear from the stakeholders. I don't, okay, although I'm never worried about Ms. Kaplan speaking up when she has something to say. Um, the only thing I would I would present um, to the board is uh, under the current workload, it only facility hardship is only going to the top of the month. So in in this situation for the 415 million, um, my recommendation as you look at this is that anybody that comes in with a facility hardship automatically goes to the top of the line, no matter where they are on the unfunded list. So it, it's a little bit of tweak. It doesn't necessarily go by full order, but that they automatically get bumped up to the top because it is a health and safety consideration and the budget letter um, that was produced uh, at the end of April said that that is one of the major considerations. Okay, anybody else have anything to add on this? I just, I just have a question. When we first went down this path of the pooled money investment um, board ceasing um, their operations or putting the freeze on, and then we um, provided the lists of what we wanted um, to, or, or what our need was for the future bond sales that subsequently did occur. My recollection is, did we place facility hardships in a priority order or in earlier um, lists that went over and did they get funded in a priority order or was it simply the order as you describe it, Juan, of them being at the top of each month that might have gotten uh, received funding? I believe that Chris something out here, but I believe that that was for the uh, apportionments prior to December 2008. Correct. That Correct. That applied to apportionments before December 18, 2008, uh, but that was actually the Department of Finance that prioritized the facility hardships on the list that was provided to them. So, so every every um, the the list of people who were stalled immediately that had been apportioned and then they couldn't get the funding. Then you just took all the facility hardships and as the bond sales happened in March and April, you fed those first. Correct. Um, and it wasn't just facility hardships; it was for all health and safety projects uh, across all of the different programs throughout the state. They were prioritized. These projects all had apportionments, and the uh, Department of Finance provided at the time it was uh, pooled money investment account funding for these projects. And so then the second, so then after um, that, we got through those dis those projects through December 18th. Then we began creating the unfunded list. Correct. Correct. That's and, what the, the board did. They established right. a... And then, the, and then the board and OPSC or the board at some point, I'm sorry, this is the part where I'm the new kid, that they decided to, the, the facility hardships went on the top of each month's list. So right. That's like, my understanding. like say for example, that what we just did last week, uh, two weeks ago, we stopped in the middle of July 22nd. And so that meant that we probably hit all the facility hardships that were on the July 22nd agenda because they were at the top of that day's list. And there's never never been a, we haven't, finance nor OPSC nor the board has ever changed that in terms of, because really the budget letter 0909 was continued to be enforced and so the health and safety thing still was in play. It kind of might have made a slight error, maybe. 
But at, at the time, finance only provided for those projects that had apportionments. Uh, that would be the difference between the unfunded approvals and the apportionments. So we provided funding for health and safety projects that already had apportionments. Um, so moving forward, the board created an unfunded list. These were all new projects that were being identified, um, whereas previously those had been apportioned projects prior to December, I believe it's 17, 2008. So our, our current apportion, uh, the, the way the board is currently choosing to apportion, we're, we may be apportioning, we, we, we may not really be taking that into consideration. We might actually be violating both the old budget letter and the new budget letter, just in our regular process, forget about this new special thing. That would be in the board's list of priorities that's submitted to finance. Um, ultimately, funds provided for the, the programs, um, for the various state programs, are held by the, the Department of Finance. And I, I would note, though, that the regulations provide uh, the flexibility to the board to set aside funds for hardship projects. Okay. As a follow-up, Chris, um, I, for one, do agree that the health and safety issue should have priority. If we have a reservation of funds, is that sufficient to do it? Uh, I wouldn't be able to answer that. Um, that, of course, that's a, a board priority. Uh, the difference between a, a health and safety project, a facility hardship project, is those are projects that have been identified that need to be rectified within one year, whereas the traditional projects don't have that one year uh, necessity. Juan or Lisa, if there is an interest, a collective interest in, in having a recognition that these health and safety projects should proceed wherever possible, would you recommend a priority? Would you recommend a reservation? How do you answer the, what would your recommendation be if that was the will of the board? Staff has always considered these projects to be a priority because of the health and safety nature. That's why we prioritize them when we get them in our shop. And that's what we put into the top of the list, the list of each month's board. So we do think that they're a priority. We do think that they have a critical need. Um, and, and we do think that the subcommittee should consider a reservation for these. Because that would set that money aside for them only. Okay. Slightly, slightly, slightly different because I don't think we actually have to do a reservation. I think the board can just say policy-wise, uh, out of the $415 million, the first priority is health and safety. So any uh, health and safety facility hardship project that comes in automatically just goes to the top of the list and then kind of like date order and then everybody who's not facility hardship gets funded under that so that they automatically um, get the money because I know this more at a I believe two or three months ago, you actually brought this item up in our regular how we do our unfunded list. So I know that the board um, making these a priority is something that has been stated before, but I don't think you necessarily need to do a set aside um, unless in this and this funding of 415 million, you want to make sure that all of those that are facility hardship get taken care of, but maybe not necessarily in the timeline of getting the money out as quickly, because we don't know whether those those facility hardship projects will actually come into access this funding if given the opportunity. Well, that was going to be my follow-up question. Uh... <laughs> I saw it as a double-edged sword. I saw the fact that uh, they might not come in, and then what? On the other hand, um, I didn't want to create a stampede so that those that weren't health and safety might suck up all the 415. It almost is this question of equitable funding. We heard some concern at our last board meeting that some districts might be better prepared to move, and they might be located in a geographical area, and they could easily suck up all or a chunk of, and what do we do about the rest of us kind of thing. So there is this balancing act of making sure we, we A, if we choose to prioritize health and safety, but also do what we can to ensure there is an equitable distribution geographically. Another option to consider is take what we know of um, the workload list of being approximately 18, which after May is going to be $18.1 million. And if the board as a policy decides to just fund that and give them apportionments, 
um, then that's a set aside directly out of the 415, making them a priority and uh, not be hold them to any, any timeline to access the funding. And that would be taking care of one of your issues and then it becomes a board policy of maybe creating a priority of any time funding comes through, no matter where a facility hardship or health and safety issue is on the funded list, they um, get first priority. Well, if I may, um, because I have raised this in the past, I will say um, I think how I'll be looking at things today is that for the most part I would like to see the integrity of the list and then our other objectives. So I'll be looking at meeting our other objectives if that is what we desire as a subcommittee or ultimately as a board, um, how that uh, impacts the list and I would want to keep it as um, fair as possible on that on that piece of it. That being said, I have asked about facility hardship before, but I don't think that the board has had the policy discussion about, okay, we've never placed them on a higher priority, and should we be? And I'm a little reluctant to um, change that without that good policy discussion. What are those projects, and should they be at the top of any list that we do at any time? Um, as opposed to making a decision today to say they simply go to the top of the list because they're labeled facility hardship. I don't think the board has had that policy discussion and that's what I've asked for. And then from that policy discussion, if it's good for this program, in, or if it's good for the pilot in this case that we're saying those are the, then it should be, we should be able to say that about them always. And I'm not so sure I can say that. Um, that's why I raised it. And so I'm not automatically predisposed that they go to the top of the line right now. Well, actually, I just, I think, just, I agree with everything, exactly everything you just said, but one, one thought I have is I think that, that the essence of this one time only thing that we're talking about is just creating, it's reor one time only reordering the list. And since our, and to, let's say, you know, to, to keep our tradition on the list, we already put facility hardships at the top of every month's list. So, in terms of this one-time only deal, the so facility the complete. Time. Yeah, and then and then I think that you know, as you probably remember, I actually it's one of my I've made two big errors at state allocation board meetings. One being, well, only that one out. But this the other time I confused facility and financial hardship. You know, when you were talking about it, and I think that we should have the discussion. I don't know if we can have it in May, but maybe we even should try to have it in May, because it's sort of a fundamental question that would inform the rest of the discussion. So anyway, I th we have some friends that have something to say. Thank you. Dave Walrath, representing Small School Districts Association. I sent you a variety of proposals for consideration, all within the general construct of what's in front of the subcommittee and the board without getting into too much trouble too fast. Uh, you have the opportunity to have paralysis through analysis. And in your last discussion, the last 10 minutes highlighted that. Because it appears that you have at least four different goals you're trying to accomplish and you do not have consensus on what your goals are. It's easier to have consensus on goals than fit in a program to accomplish those goals than to look at each single item and then try to figure out what your end product is. I say this because it appears from at least our understanding is that one goal is to spend $415 million out the door just as fast as humanly possible. A second goal is to see how the school facility program can be used to enhance economic development and create jobs. Those may be overlapping goals, but they are not totally overlapping goals. The question is, are, do you want to limit yourself to, you have to limit yourself to 415 mil, because that's all you have. But do you want to look at your pilot program, because as small school districts, we like date order. But if there is to be a pilot program, do you want to look at it on a dollar term, or do you want to look at it on a time term? How many people can come forward claiming how much money that would create jobs? If it's more than 415, then you deal 
how you figure out how you deal with that, the remainder of the list. If it's only 415, you're fine. If it's less than 415, I think we'll all be shocked. But is it a but if the goal is to see how the school facilities program can be used in a pilot to expand economic development, then I would suggest you want to look beyond simply the 415 and you look at a broader way of getting there. Uh, secondly, we believe that if this is going to be the case as a pilot program, you should look at this as a funnel and try to have the broadest aperture you possibly can at the top of the funnel, knowing that the bottom is going to be narrowed, to expand the opportunities for districts who might be able to participate in the pilot program. And by that, we suggest you go beyond simply the current unfunded list and look at what's in OPSC on the workload list. Look at what's out of DSA. Because quite frankly, once you're out of DSA, you can go to bid and write a contract and get people going as you await the process. And school districts on the workload list can do that now. Can't write a contract until you have approval on Field Act. But after that, if you have local funds and you're willing to make a commitment and go forward, then you can do that. It's a way of encouraging the use of local funds if you go beyond simply the unfunded list. So encourage you to figure out is it simply to spend 415 as fast as possible, to spend 415 to create jobs, or to see how the school facilities program can create jobs and then define the type of program that you want to accomplish that final goal. Thank you. Yes. Madam Chair and members, Tom Duffy for cash. Uh, just on the issue of uh, prioritizing facility hardships, that was something that was not, to our knowledge, determined by the board. I believe it was determined by Rob Cook when he was the EO uh, that that should happen. And we questioned that at the time. Uh, not that we were not in favor of that, but just it was not something the board determined to do. It was something that was, uh, I think, the EO's uh, determination. So that may be something you would like to discuss among each other and with the, the members of the board. Uh, with regard to the overall question of having a choosing priority or choosing option three, we have uh, submitted a letter to you. We are, we're not objecting to this. Uh, we're suggesting that you be very careful how you begin some determination to spend the $415 million uh, on those districts that may come in the door. And I know, uh, Mr. Harvey, you're thinking of the 60 days, and we're, we're thinking that it needs to be a little bit longer, maybe about 90 days. But to encourage districts to step up and begin the process of initiating uh, construction contracts. So we, we think that, that the board wants to go in this direction. We're not entirely comfortable with that, but we're trying to, to make sure that we support the efforts of the board to do what we continually hear from the administration and also from others, that uh, we, we encourage districts to put projects on the street and, and take risks. This is a very difficult time for school districts for a variety of reasons. And, and that I'm sure you and I have talked about this in, in, in great detail. Uh, at, at your suggestion, we did a survey of districts, uh, districts that have taken the risk, have gone out and, and have um, entered into contracts. We know about two-thirds of the respondents to our survey have actually entered into contracts and, and, and have spent money that is all their money, so the state will be reimbursing them. So we, we think that there are certainly districts that are willing to go out to bid and to enter into contracts and spend money and we want we want this 415 plus madam chair members the 961 or 63 million dollars to to uh, be spent as well it's important for us to say that this is stretching because we've always said date order first in first out there, there was litigation in the early part of the last decade because of uh, a question from a uh, district in Southern California about first in, first out. And it was it was a very difficult time. We're not challenging the thought. We're supporting the thought. We just ask that you consider what we wrote to you. And this is and consider this not to be a pilot. Mr. Walrath mentioned
mission pilot. <laughs> I, I would prefer to call it something like an incentive program. Let's incentivize districts to come in the door now. So we would support that and we would ask that, that you recognize that districts are having great difficulty. And Mr. Harvey, I've had conversations with you and others in general services, and there seems to be a theme that I'm uncomfortable with, and that is that school districts are not doing their job. School districts are doing their job. The state of California is in great circumstances, dire circumstances, where they are, school districts are not always able to do what they were doing in the past. And I want to make sure that you and I and the other members of the board can continually dialogue about districts meeting their objective of educating children at a time when they don't necessarily have all the general fund that they need to, to hire teachers and others, as well as those capital outlay dollars. And at the local level, and I did this as a superintendent, the local level, we don't always have the opportunity to convince the public that capital dollars can't be spent on teacher salaries. I look forward, Mr. Duffett, to having an offline conversation about your allegation that we are alleging that school districts are not doing their job. I think that's a very unfair characterization. This is an effort by this board, it was a board direction, to try to do something a little bit different. I don't know what you're alerting to, alluding to. Uh, that's why we'll talk in my office or your office about it, because I think that is unfair to say publicly. I will look forward to the discussion. So and, why? And, and thank you. Okay. Any anything else on facility hardship? I I, can, I I want to ask you a question. Did you ever get that? Do you know the number? Um, we have two billion dollars that we have sold bonds for two billion dollars. That I don't know. We I didn't get an update from you on where we are in terms of drawdowns. But do you know what the interest costs are? General fund cost to the general fund for interest on the two billion. I do not because it changes for each bond sale the interest paid on each bond. Can you just can you write to them and just get a quick estimate? Because sure, I, I, I can see what I can find. Okay. I, I just think that's so. I think I, I want to answer to kind of get to Mr. Walras's point because I think he raises an important one. And generally speaking, when I start down a path, I like to kind of have a goal of where I'm going. I. I think that I think it's a little bit harder to define in this setting in some ways, although you you kind of struggling with that too, I think. But I think that, you know, for me, it really is about this cash balance. I think that's why I started talking about it with staff, why I brought it up to the board and why, you know, I kind of drove us to this point is I'm more approaching it from the standpoint that we have a lot of cash which are now caught you know creating general fund pressure because that two billion dollars of bonds that have been sold now mind you I know a lot of it was sold recently we only portioned it at our last meeting I know districts are struggling to get all their forms in and and there is going that money is going to go out the door it still is general fund dollars to the state that's paying those interest costs and from my point of view you know in finance it's one of those you know we're going to have uh, terrible, terrible news on Friday, as we were, as it was said in the paper today. And so, when we're creating general fund pressure, and we're not building schools, I think it's time to put the brakes on and ask the question: What can we do, you know, in this new setting? And 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 what can we do in our program? And that's why that's how I'm approaching it. So I just wanted to answer your question, but I think I heard from the board a kind of a broad range of goals, and I think that we can design this one time only thing that may or may not be a pilot in such a way that it meet, reaches, achieves multiple goals. And then we can see from there if we have want to make changes to the program to meet additional goals in some other time period. So that was a long-winded answer. Um, so I think the, any other points on facility hardship? Do you know, by the way, I also thought the point Mr. Walworth made was interesting about whether or not we could include other, how we could include other projects where they might be at DSA or might be on your workload or might be somewhere? Um, no, we're, the process that we're, we're trying to lay out is uh, the board has to approve the projects. We have to know what the dollar figures are and they get placed on fund list before they can receive an apportionment. Uh, for the board to consider making apportionments to projects that are on the OPSC workload or 
or at DSA that we haven't even reviewed yet, I don't think that we have um, a mechanism uh, or the authority to do that without a review and approval by the board. Okay. And we would be concerned with uh, providing the authority uh, for apportioning those projects that may or may not be approved in the end. Uh, we don't know if DSA will approve some of these projects. We don't know if they have eligibility for these projects. Uh, those are all questions that would need to be answered before you could move on to the work list. I guess I was really thinking conceptually of something where you have a, where a district asserts that they have a project sitting in a bin somewhere in somebody's bin that they know if they could get it th expedited through the process that they might be able to do something quicker with. Did, <laughs> this is your qu issue. <laughs> Thank you. And, and that was part of it. To the extent that you're trying to find out how many people can get out and go out to bid in 60 days and sign contracts. If you're looking beyond the 415 million and you're looking at a time frame, then you can look at those that are being processed through OPSC or going into OPSC, where you do the trigger of the funding only after they're apportioned, but you know that they have made the commitment that they can do that once they're apportioned. Okay, thanks. Madam Chair, is it your intent to have the subcommittee make a comment or, or a direction to the full board on each of these issues? Uh, we're not I think I do think by the I think by the time we get to the end of this, we have to have some sort of agreement amongst ourselves what we are going to say to the board. Okay. And obviously, we have to do that here. Um, I don't okay. think we have the flexibility of doing it over in your office or Mr. Duffy's office. So um, we have to have that discussion. Do you want to have it at each point, or do you I, want do, to I was asking keep going? for your guidance because I don't know. I sort of want to go all the way through. I think. Um, I, per, I would prefer to go through them and then have kind of summarize and, and discuss because I think one may uh, inform the other. No question about it. That's why I asked. Okay, so financial hardship. Juan, did you have something on that? Just want to. We combined under number three financial hardship projects and small school district projects, but they don't necessarily have to be one and the same. We can actually have the discussion separately um, to deal with financial hardship projects. And should they be treated differently? Should they have a reservation? Uh, more time, perhaps, in terms of making the apportionments? And then we can also have a discussion about small school districts, um, the different challenges that they face uh, in terms of competing or entering into contracts and being able to certify. So we have them both combined, Madam Chair, but we can talk about them separately um, if you'd like. Either way. Okay. Then I think it would be easier if we talk about financial hardship projects first. Um, and one of the discussions that I think the subcommittee needs to have is the issue with site and design only apportionments. These are projects that are receiving planning money or grants to acquire land uh, versus projects that are uh, construction ready. They come in with plans approved by DCE, DSA. So I think the subcommittee should consider whether these should receive the same type of priority uh, or not. But it's one of the issues that came up, and uh, we think that the subcommittee should consider in terms of having the same priority. And uh, aside from that, should financial hardships in general receive perhaps more time in making the apportionments uh, and or uh, additional reservation of funds for them uh, or a different type of priority? Did you have a recommendation on that? We're seeking input from, from uh, at this point, from, from stakeholders. Any? Well, I, I have a general comment as we approach it. Um, again, I think in keeping with um, the general integrity of the program, um, my interest would be that all projects would have um, an equal shake in this um, in this new um, funding program and that would include hardship projects so I would want to see that um, we 
could potentially see if we could potentially address their issues. Um, and the one I understand is that um, because they rely 100% or up to 100% on the state, that in order to sign a contract, they actually have to have the dollars. So um, it's a little bit of the chicken or the egg um, in that they, um, unlike a 50-50 a district, when they came forward and said, I can sign a contract within 60 days, they need to know that the money is actually in the bank before they do that. I think it's a law. Um, so how we, how we contend with that, I'm interested in the solution because I don't want to unnecessarily X them out of the potential to access the funds. On the, on the other side of that, I don't want to see great leeway given either because everyone else says, well, you know, the objective here is move, move, if one of the objective is to move funds quickly, hardships come along with us. But let's take care of your particular issue. Um, so that's how I would like to approach it as one board member and perhaps hear from the hardship districts how they think it could work for them. Oh, Lisa? Um, the only uh, suggestion of what I've heard in talking to both districts in, in this regard is it seems to me because they are uh, reliant on state funding and they don't have the funding to start, is a consideration as FUC after page two, it has the implementation timeline of potentially looking at uh, where it says the 60-day fund relief request period, that financial hardship, um, and I'm also lumping small school districts have board considered between 90 and 120 days. So they would still be able to play equally of putting it in, but that they would have a little longer time to get all their ducks in a row because they, they, need, they need to know they're getting the funding and then they can move forward and sometimes it takes them a little longer one when you need 100 percent funding and two small school districts sometimes your superintendent is the principal or your business is your facilities uh, manager and it does take a little longer while i hear that the longer time i'm i'm less i guess i would be less tolerant of the longer time and more tolerant of the actual issue that hardships have and i think that that is signing a contract before they have the funds in the bank so how do we reconcile that issue while remaining true to a timeline that everyone else has to play within everyone else ha has the same issues that hardships have in, in getting these projects moving forward, as do smalls, but let's deal with the specific issue that they have and try and resolve that. One of the um, solutions, Ms. Moore, that, that we've heard is that small school districts or large school, any school district for that matter, that they can include certain language in the contracts that they enter into that it's subject to state bond or state funds being available. That is something that um, we are aware that's already been used. I don't know if that's the, the only solution, but that's something that we've heard as a possible solution. So, you, so it's possible to have a single application, a financial hardship district could have a single application, be on our list, and that would be for both property acquisition and construction, one project. That, Chris, is that right? That's correct. So, so, financial hardship districts, they do have the ability to come in and ask for design only uh, or site, and actually design and or site, by hand of having the project go through the CDE and DSA. They have that option. They don't have to exercise that option. They can come in and, and, and submit a full funding request after the approvals are. So is, it what, so is it what you're suggesting is is that there might be a financial hardship district that has an, is on our list, has all three of those components in there, and you're suggesting that we would allow them to separate it? or Because they may not be able to say that they have actually signed a contract for construction because they have not acquired the property yet. And that's the difference. It, Mr. Harvey. I'll defer. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Um, could it be too that there is a district on the list um, and that they have the site um, high on the list and they have the construction maybe low on the list? Um, 
are you asking that they be combined or are you asking that the site be allowed to proceed just like any other project it's a project in and of itself you you can you can acquire the site within the time frame that the that the board determines and then therefore that piece of your project is done that ultimately later or at the same time, depending upon where that lies for a certain district, you could compete also for the construction yes, more, that's what we're So you're asking us not to exclude site and design on hardships? Yes. Okay. Just so as to treat them in the same way that they would be treated under the program as it normally exists, would we are in an extraordinary time? We're asking to stay as close to the, the and it would be a flow of funds. It, it would be, be acquisition. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and so, are you also saying to separate ones that are combined, allow that to happen too, or just if they're already separated, allow the property acquisition to get funded? If, you, if you're not ready to go forward with construction to allow the property acquisition to go forward and then for them to come in, and maybe they, they happen at the same time, maybe they, they're separated by a short distance. Mr. Duffy, what do you have to say about the, the time frame to acquire property? If we say right now what's proposed, and we're all grappling with that, is that within 60 days you can be 50% under contract. That's what's proposed. What is, would we say the same for, what would we say about the property acquisition such that you're at, that those funds are flowing out to the district? I don't know all the circumstances that exist. I do know that there are districts that are that have notified property owners that they want to acquire those properties under eminent domain, uh, and, and that that brings certain pressures upon the district as well as upon the property owners. So what I would say is that there, maybe there's some discussion to more of what would be an appropriate and. Uh, regular timeline for, for, for such initiation of, of property acquisition. May I just ask staff, when we normally fund a, a site acquisition of a financial hardship, um, do we do we do they file a fund release and do we simply give them the money per that fund release? What happens? Uh, for site acquisition, a district only has to have a uh, contingent site approval letter from the Department of Education and a preliminary appraisal. Uh, in fact, the appraisal, I don't think they even have access to the site. And then we will uh, grant an apportionment for site acquisition only. So that is enough then. It, it, would, it would just normally go its course. Is that correct? And so if we come down to someone that says, I want to move forward on this site, I want to be considered part of this $415 million. Um, I, fund, I file my 50-05, is it? And, uh, and we say, good, go out and acquire the site. It may take them six months to do it. If there's a lot of parcels, it may take them two weeks if they've got it all wrapped up, right? Mr. Hart. Thank you. Uh, I will tell you for me when I heard the board talk about it at this last meeting and when I heard uh, Senator Hancock preface her remarks, it was about shovel ready. It was about creating jobs in this very difficult and untimely time. So I will only support things that are for construction ready activities. I want to create new jobs and to fund something that is an acquisition or fund something which is a design moves money, but it doesn't have the parallel advantage of creating that local economic stimulus and creating safer schools now for kids. So for me, it's going to be construction ready. Uh, 
Mr. Harvey and said, again, I may incur your wrath, and I apologize for The only time you will incur my wrath is when you make unsolicited comments when you don't have anything to support it. I will respect you on all policies. We could go to Dawson's or something later. And you and I will talk about those. They're not unsupported, and I wish it was with you, but not the whole thing. It seems to me that if we stay, again, my comments a few minutes ago, if we stay as close to the current program as we can, then we will support what the board wants to do. Supporting this change for this four hundred fifteen million is huge for this organization that I represent. It is not something we would normally do at this point. So we would ask for your support for staying as close to the program as possible, including allowing districts that are hardship districts that do not have the ability to acquire land without the support of the allocation board's funds. To do that under this $450 million experiment, and then to be able to go forward with construction. And it may be that they happen almost simultaneously. And we would be pleased to work with you, Department of General Services, to monitor this because we are asking our districts, and I think you're aware of this, that we have we've done one survey, we're doing a second survey. We'd be pleased to work with you on an additional survey, but let's stay as close to the fabric of the fundamentals of this program as we can. And again, I'd ask you to support that. I understand what you're saying, but please, I'd ask you to think about that. Thank you, and I, and I appreciate your consideration and your thanks for me can, personally. Can I, um, can, can, can Chris please speak, please? While we understand your uh, concerns, Mr. Harvey, uh, we'd also like to point out that with site acquisition, there are jobs that are created and, and saved. And also to the extent that you're providing reimbursement funds to districts, you're providing for additional cash flow at that district, which may also preserve jobs at the local level. Um, so it, in providing for site acquisition, you are maintaining, say, uh, realtor jobs, commissions on uh, brokering accounts. And so there, there is an economic stimulus to those as well. And that's, and I'd like just to, I, I want to just make sure you weren't going to counteract what I was going to say. That's exactly the position of the director on, on this on this program. That and we really are. I mean, from finances point of view, we are very concerned about the cash and about getting it out. And so I would be in support of making sure that these costs. I mean, we're trying to. I'm focused. If I do something here, I'm focused more on the cash than I am on any other piece of it. So thank you. If I may, just I'll weigh in on this unless you're going to talk about site acquisition. I was going to talk about site acquisition. Okay, please. <clears throat> but it was going to be more on what Chris has said, so why don't you make your comment? Well, I, I, um, I would weigh in on it in, in this, in the filters that I think we set out in the beginning was um, the flow of funds, job creation, and then um, from our perspective, it's um, integrity of those that are waiting. And so it, it actually meets, I think, two of that in terms of not, it's not construction jobs, um, but it's, uh, it is, there are some jobs that are created through this and I believe that a hardship district we, we want to propel people forward so the person that acquires the property their next step is to go to construction and if we X them out of that we X out that potential construction job down the road as well um, so we would also support that site acquisition um, be a very important component of this as well I think what's an open question for me and I guess I, I, I look back at you want is that is is are these applications where somebody has come in and has requested acquisition design and construction all in one so on our on our chart there's one line for hard financial hardship district X for you know two two million dollars but a hundred thousand of that these are two the lower numbers but the you know part of the part of that is for the property acquisition can we separate them and or should we separate them for financial hardship districts they can be separate they can submit a separate application for each one for the designer site for a non-financial hardship districts they're not separated and that, but I mean on but on our list right now they may or may not be separated and so could we would we want to make allow a financial hardship district to separate them if they were ready to do acquisition but not ready to construct? Uh, it's an open question for me. 
Yeah, on the current and funded list, the ones that did apply separately are uh, noted as as uh, acquisition only. Or design. That's. I think that's the easier one to pick yeah, off. That's easy. The one that isn't easy is is it all combined. And I think what you're asking is they may be ready for site acquisition, but they couldn't say within 60 days they'd have 50% under con construction contract because they don't have the property yet. So I guess the question you're asking is um, can we allow that financial hardship district to ask only for site acquisition when we when they've asked for an entire project? to begin with. So that's a, that's a policy question and, and I think you're seeing support for that so uh, at least of two of the three and then we go to the board and so how, how can we accomplish that? Dave Walrath representing Small School Districts Association. I know you split the issue, but from our point of view, most small district projects are financial hardship projects, so we kind of see the issue as a combined issue. Uh, let me first touch on the site acquisition. I would request that if it's a site acquisition only, but yes, it is funded because you do have a multiplier effect of money. The money isn't going to be put in a bank and disappear. Somebody's going to receive the money from the sale of the site and then use it for other economic activity as well as reimbursement and a variety of other things. But for a hardship district, if they have a reimbursement for a site, it may be a long time before they're eligible to go forward with construction. If they're willing to borrow funds to expedite their construction project, is there a way of making a waiver in the hardship process so those districts could do that without penalty. That they could be potentially reimbursed for loan origination, some of the interest and like that, if they're willing to make that commitment and go forward, if it's a site only type of reimbursement. I would like you to consider that. The second is, uh, you would raise the issue of uh, looking at this in expedited and money might sit around. The problem is on a site acquisition, if you're doing a uh, eminent domain, you might have nine of the ten parcels done quickly. The tenth may take a lot longer for a variety of reasons. When you get to the point about penalties for people who can't quite make it to where they're going, if you could keep in mind that there are issues in site acquisition, particularly if you're using eminent domain, which can cause people to not make their timelines and maybe they shouldn't be penalized in those types of situations. I, I don't think there's a penalty or a timeline on the site acquisition. You simply fund your, file your fund release and oh. we say go acquire the property. Well, I agree under current law, but as one of the nine points that was raised by staff, they'll be coming to you is what type of penalty should apply if people weren't able to accomplish just raising the issue that site acquisition sometimes has unanticipated issues that could cause people not to be able to do what they thought they were going to be able to do in the time frame. Thank you. Dennis Dunstan with Total School Solutions. I know I'm kind of jumping around here, but I'd like to uh, address the Kathleen's uh, concern about putting school districts in a position of committing to a construction contract without being assured of the uh, that the money is going to be available. I think that concern is good for not just financial hardship districts, but also there's a lot of small school districts out there that may have their local 50%, but they don't have additional funding locally to handle 100% of, of the contract. They may have gone out for a bond for just one project and may not have the ability to complete that entire project locally. Uh, if you put those school districts in, in the position of, of uh, committing to a construction contract, that's going to put them in tremendous risk and that, that puts their general fund in risk because they do have the, they sign the contract and uh, they're committed to do that or, or be sued for the, the total amount. Um, I, I understand uh, Mr. Morales' uh, comment about putting language in the contract to uh, postpone until the the, uh, uh, the SAB has apportioned the money. However, that puts the contractors, the subcontractors, and the suppliers in a very uh, awkward position because they have to, the contractor has to commit, has to get his subcontractors and suppliers to commit to an amount. And I've talked to contractors and they say usually that's about 30 days that the subcontractors will commit to their, their amount. Um, 
And if you don't have a date certain, if we don't know when the next bond sale is going to be, it may be six months, uh, a year, and a contractor cannot commit to that. They put themselves in financial jeopardy uh, if they commit to that uh, for long term. This is money that's readily available. They don't have to sell bonds. I understand that. But, well, if, if that's the case, if we stay with that, option two, I don't believe, had that provision. I think option three does about stay. Option three. Yes, but uh, we talked earlier about there may be some going back and forth. I just want to make sure that we don't put school districts in, in jeopardy in the position of, of uh, uh, signing contracts without the, the money. So, Dennis, are in the scenario of you have currently on the table, so to speak, is you have 30 days to tell us that indeed in 60 days, I think it's a proposal, some people have asked for 90, but in 60 or 90 days, uh, you can bid and be under contract for this project, knowing that after the 30 days, we said we will fund you. Do you see that as a problem? No, not not if, okay. you, if the, the state allocation board commits to funding that project if the contracts are signed. No, I don't see a problem. Thank it's you. only in the in the instance where you're required to uh, submit the full 5005, which requires signed contracts, prior to knowing that you have that funding available. That's that's my concern. Maybe I should ask this of staff as well. Would that be a pro problem for a hardship district? I mean, they're guaranteed that we've said we'll fund you. Maybe my is my question earlier is answer my own question. That it, if we say if they say yes, I'm going to do it. I come in. I got. The, the, I'm I'm part of the group that gets allocated the 450 million. I have 60 to 90 days to per, to go under contract, knowing that that funds will be there. There shouldn't be a problem for them either, should there? No. The, and, and let let me clarify because you're actually along with the run. Um, I've talked to some contractors, especially with this, if, as we've laid out on kind of the timeline, is if the board in May approves this new $415 million program and it's a known entity and districts go out and sign contracts, what they'll have is date certain of if the board decides August 4th. So it's it's kind of like a temporary, it's an option. Think of it kind of like an option to purchase land. You have 60, 90 days. That's what would be in the contract language of of, you know, we're signing contracts for potentially this. This contract does not become valid until August 4th, and contractors are more willing to sign that because they know there's a date certain. It's not a unknown 60, 90, 120 days out. They will know if that contract is valid on, on August 4th. So then can we say that the, the current proposal is not um, damaging to hardship districts? And I want to hear if anybody believes that it is so that we get that issue kind of put to rest, that we're treating hardship and then non-hardship projects the same, other than the um, uh, preliminary apportionment issue we just discussed. Is there any other problems for hardships? I, I'd just like to make one, one final comment, and that, that is that uh, this is this is being considered or at least uh, partially considered as a pilot program, which means that it could continue on past the $400 million that is currently existing. That That's my comment. If, if this does continue on as a permanent program that we have to, the, the regulations that we put in place for this or the policies have to consider the fact that in the future the same thing happens. You, you don't put... Uh, uh, school districts in that in that position. Thank you. Duly noted. I think I, I really do want to just say I think the board was pretty clear that this was kind of a one time only shot, and I know pilot for some has a pejorative term, but um, but I think it's something we that's one of the things. If we're, even if we don't call it a pilot, it's still something everybody in this room needs to have in the back of their mind. The things that, the, the things that work and don't work, and what what are what are the what what could happen. And so as we go forward, you know, we we know what the stumbling blocks are. So appreciate it, but I don't want to get too distracted by them either.
Thank you very much. My name is Bruce Hancock. I'm with Hancock Gunnison Park. Uh, our firm uh, prepared um, a lengthy proposal. I hope you got to see it. Um, obviously, it's just our idea, but we did try to address many of these issues uh, that you're talking about now, so I hope it's helpful to you. Certainly, they're not the only answers or the only ways that these issues can be addressed. Uh, I just, uh, it's almost that while I was standing here, uh, Kathleen, you really began I think to clarify the issue that I wanted to mention. Uh, first, um, uh, notwithstanding Mr. Harvey's concern about construction ready projects, and, and I clearly understand that, but if you move beyond that to getting fund releases, there already is definitions of how and what you have to do for fund release, uh, to submit a fund release. It, you need to only say that a district must submit the fund re release request within a certain period of time, and they will have done whatever it is. They will have done their their um, uh, uh, approvals, etc. So it's not necessary to define all of these things. They are already defined. Um, I think the other thing that I wanted to mention is that is that um, in in um, going down the list, um, districts uh, and projects are already on, on the unfunded list for whatever it might be, site acquisition or planning. And, and again, I understand the argument, uh, the discussion, but they are there and, and it would seem to me if the, if the object is to stay as close to the current process, then really all we are asking is who of those projects, which of those projects can step out and commit to making uh, 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 that they will ask for a fund release within a specific period of time and none of them need take any action sign contracts or commit themselves in any other way except to say that they will do those things necessary to make that fund release if they have a commitment from the board for an apportionment so what you're asking them in the beginning is simply to come forward and and really make a promise really make a commitment to the board that if I receive this apportionment, I will fill in the blank, whatever period of time. And, and so they're, they're, they're not having to go out on a limb. There's no necessity to do that, uh, except, uh, you know, to be prepared to step up and, and, and fulfill uh, their commitment when, when the uh, time is right. So um, I think that some of these details are really already here in the process, and we're just asking folks to, to um, tell you oh, one, one other thing, and it's slightly out of line, but it has to do with regulations that uh, I know. I happen to share your uh, belief, Mr. Harvey, that regulations are maybe an important thing for the board to consider here. But, um, I, and I know the board was worried about slowing the process down, but I do believe uh, that it is possible for you to pursue parallel tracks, exactly as you said, Mr. Harvey, while this is going on. In other words, you're going to have to have a period of time where you're going to ask school districts to make this commitment to the board. And you're going to have to give them until, perhaps if you drop this in, in May, you're going to have to give them until the June board or the July board to let you know that they're out there so that you can then put them into a new date order list. Um, in, in that particular case, uh, there is time to adopt emergency regulations. You have uh, in OPSC probably the best person in the state in terms of, of adopting regulations and uh, and if she can't do it, I don't think anyone can and I think she can. So you might also keep that in mind. Who, who is that person? Uh, Lisa Dunn. <laughs> She's done it many, many, many times. She sides. was blushing. I thought you meant her. <laughs> Hi, Richard Gonzalez, Richard Gonzalez and Associates, and I'd like to answer your question. Richard Gonzalez and Richard Gonzalez and Associates, sorry about my voice. Um, I want to answer your question about financial hardship school districts and the concerns that may or may not be out there. Um, I'll start by saying there's been a recent change in the way fund releases are being done in that not only do we have to have contracts, but we also have to have notices to proceed issued. That has not been the case all along. Uh, in the past, we were able to get fund releases with just a construction contract and a notice to proceed forthcoming. For financial hardship districts, that means something because if we get the construction 
construction contract. And we give them, let's say, a month to start the notice to proceed. In that month period of time, districts that are financial hardships were able to have received the fund release dollars in their fund and be able to pay for these. Okay? If you go to a process in which you require both the notice to proceed and the contract, that makes it very difficult because now the contractor started work. He's going to provide his first draw and they may not have the money because the fund release has not been processed yet as, it, as, as we see it right now. My concern is that there be a process in which the contract can be signed, the notice proceed can be issued thereafter, knowing that the money has been submitted and received over at the Financial Hardship School District because they have, as been said before, themselves out there committing to, to contractors and the contractor is going to provide that uh, billing and they expect to get paid. Do you have any comments on that? Um, again, the timeline I think clarifies things, which is page three behind the proposal. Uh, if the board goes forward with this process, districts do not have to commit or have a contract in that time. They just know to start getting their ducks in a row, and then if the board decides financial hardship have 90 or 120 days, the minute they the SAB awards apportionment to them, then that's where they can go to contract. However, if they want to start early and put their ducks in a row, that's when you can put the contract language in. But there is no harm if they wait until the day of apportionment to then within 120 days get under contract um, and be able to proceed with the construction. They what, don't have to do it beforehand. I'm more curious about Mr. Gonzalez's point on the notice to proceed. I didn't know what he was talking about on that. Yeah, that, that's a certain requirement for, for the program. Um, that this was have to comply right now. And go with is, that in, is that in our regulations and that was approved yeah. by the board? Yeah, it's, it's part of the fund release form, which is a regulation. And where does the notice to proceed come from? Is that like from the city or the, the, the school district to the contractor? Yeah. Same. Go. Okay. And when was that added to the? Was that at, is that in addition to the form, or has that always been part of the form? It was added on the. What was the public policy reason for doing it? I had to go back and check the you should probably read that into the record. The comment from the audience was. You, you want to just come up? And just, can you come up and just come on? You you can do it on the record. Hi, I'm Suzanne Reese with the Office of Public School Construction and Fiscal Services. Um, it was added approximately 2003, 2004 when the LCP um, information came on board. So it's been in there for a while. It's in our regulations? or The forms are part of the regulations. So it was adopted by the board then? Yes, it was. It may be something that we want to look at because I, I think the point is well taken in that if we asked you to be under contract, um, and maybe Mr. Dunstan, you can help us with this, but the notice to proceed is one day you sign the contracts and then you say, okay, contractor, um, we're actually going to notice you and you must be on site by a certain day. That can trail the signing of the contract. And and I'm, I'm thinking it sometimes trails by 30 days, but or, or is there a set standard, Dennis? It, it can. No, there's no set standard. I've had contracts where you've uh, signed contracts and the next day you issue the, the notice to proceed. Uh, usually by the time you sign contracts, you've had the contractor get their bonds all together. Uh, so that, that usually takes after you receive bids a week to, to maybe two weeks. But once you sign contracts, a lot of times it's the next day. But you can, if there's some reason, you can hold off on fi filing the uh, uh, notice or issuing the notice uh, for a certain period of time. But I, I agree with uh, um, Richard, I'm sorry, I agree with Richard that can be a stumbling block because 
before probably the, this, no, but before probably the first of the year, uh, OPSC was was very quick about getting once you got those those documents in, turning the money around and getting it uh, to the county account for the for the project. However, there's been some stumbling blocks in the last uh, six months or so where that money once it's once you have all those uh, documents in, it's been we've got one project that that filed the 5005, uh, I think in. February, and they're just now getting the money. So for school districts that that have to file that notice to proceed, they have to be able to tell a contractor you're not getting paid for three or four months, and that can be a difficult. So it's just a noted possible problem, and we'll ask you to I think deal, you know recommend around it. Is it is it tr truly a, a total stumbling block that would prevent? hardships from coming forward or is it just kind of a nuance um, that that we have to deal with and maybe you can look into that. I don't think we're going to solve it today. I'm, I'm not sure that the notice is, is, is absolutely that big a deal? necessary for the fund release because you have you have signed contracts, you have the commitment to do the project. I think it's very unusual to extend that out six months a year. That, that would be uh, uh, very unusual. Okay. Anything? Oh, sorry. sorry. I'd just like to make a comment on the fund release issue. Um, our processing time generally is two to three weeks. Um, there was an anomaly that occurred with the items that were approved at the February board for activation, and that was due to some certification issues and, and things that uh, constituted more of a delay. But um, the fund release time for OPSC to the state controller is two to three weeks. And that's returned to that, that after the glitch, it's returned to that oh, yes. process. Yes. Okay. Definitely. That was a, um, yeah, we okay. fixed that. <laughs> so it might not be an issue. Yeah. Um, okay. Number, nothing else on financial hardship? Okay. Number four, equitable distribution of funds among districts. One. Fun discussion. Um, some questions are raised whether we, we should limit the amount of funds that each particular district should receive in the 415 uh, so as to distribute the funds more evenly throughout uh, all of the districts in California. So this is just added to, to have a discussion whether uh, it's definitely wants to consider that or not. Should we place some sort of limits uh, or not on any projects that submit multiple, any district that submit multiple fund releases that are on the list? Any thoughts on that from the people in the room? We did actually, um, I, I don't think it's in the pocket that chart that Michael prepared that we looked at. We kind of just ran it, we, in our, in our pre-discussions we ran a list and I think we kind of just ran a list of our unfunded and looked at it and I think no district had more than 10% on the current unfunded list, that doesn't count. But it was not very much more than 10%, 10.1% or something, right? Well, tell me if I'm wrong. I don't care. Huh? And but what percentage was that of the entire list? Okay, but five and a half percent was the biggest. Oh, okay. So yeah, 12 was the highest. Of just and that's just the unfunded list. Um, it's just one of the issues we talked about, but keeping it to the list makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, then I don't think we'll skip that one. Uh, bond source switching. Yes. The next one has to do with the projects that were originally assigned uh, a bond source, whether it be property seven, property five, property eight, uh, and given the limited amount of bond. Uh, funds left and bond authority, should they be able to switch from bond, one bond funds to another? Uh, and the simple answer for staff's point of view is we can certainly accommodate that. There's uh, some changes that would have to take place. For instance, if the project uh, was originally property seven or property five, they, had an, they, they could have had additional grant for the compliance program. If they were to switch to uh, Proposition 1D, they would have to forego that grant. Um, there's a there's a chart that we handed out to to the center. I don't know if you have it for the audience, but I want to just go through this really quickly. I think it paints a picture in terms of what's left um, in the different bond funds. We have three different pie charts. Uh, the first one on the left is Prop 1D. 
So far, we've apportioned about $1.4 billion. We have $89 million in unfunded approvals. So that gives us an approximately $152 million in remaining bonds authority. Property 5, we've apportioned about $4.6 billion. We have $284 million in unfunded approvals and approximately $68 million in remaining in bond authority. And then last in Property 7, we have apportioned about $5.7 billion. We have about $560 million in unfunded approvals and about $6.4 million in remaining bond authority. So we do have some limitations in terms of uh, switching from bond funds. Uh, but to I think that we don't have bond authority. I think the other question, though, in front of us for today is of the 415 or so that we are talking about in this one-time only special thing. What is that all? When I think that's almost all 1D, and isn't there a little 55, or is it all 1D? We have 401 million from Prop 1D. 10.7 million from Prop 55, and then 4.1 million in Prop 47. That. So the, so the question is, I mean, if you're a 47 or 55, and I don't, and on the list, do we know how what the numbers are on the list? Yes. Which is, so we have differences. I mean, so my point is, is the, I think, I mean, people, people that are in 47 and 55 that are on the unfunded list. Are, may not be able to participate in this unless they're allowed to switch funds. Correct. It, it all depends on, on who is able to submit certifications. Um, so I think the question is, is would, and I think we talked about a little bit in, you know, in our staff meeting about that there is accounting difficulties. It does give, I think, Suzanne was having a little bit of heartburn over it, mm -hmm. over it. But I think we could, we could create a system where people could switch, but we'd have to, they'd have to understand that their LCP wouldn't be paid for. They'd have to make that choice when they file that initial thing. Right. Can I comment on that, Cindy? Um, I, I've thought a lot about this, and also because, um, Let's just say the superintendent strongly supports an LCP program, and there was one that was for the first two bond measures, and then by choice of our um, how we put the third bond measure forward and the voters that we didn't have an LCP program in that. I'm wondering, that being said, I'm wondering if there is perhaps a tweener in which a district that um, has an LCP program and would be precluded from, um, so to speak, um, participating in this because of that unless they switched funds, which I, I would support a switching of funds. I think people should be able to make those decisions. But can we say that we would fund them a portion of Proposition 1D and a, and, and a portion of proposition remaining Proposition 47? I think there's 10 million, right? At, or 55, maybe given whatever they were funded from, and fund their LCP program from that those funds. So for instance, uh, let's take the next one on the list. It's Baldwin Park. And the reason we stopped where we did was because Baldwin Park is a Prop 47, I think, or is it 55? I can't remember. Keep forgetting. Prop 47 one. So we stopped there because we didn't have enough funding to fund them. We, we asked them to make a Solomon choice. Um, of course, they're going to go for big money instead of little money, and they would probably make the choice to move forward. I'm asking if we don't have to force them to make that choice, and that we say we're going to pour, we're going to fund them out of out of both funds, and we're going to fund their LCP because they did one, and any other district that did an LCP that we would fund it a portion. It that might give Suzanne a, a big heartbreak or heartburn, um, but is it possible? I think it's something we can definitely explore. We do have some split funded projects. Some projects that receive, uh, for instance, high performance uh, grants at a Proposition 1P, but uh, we also receive the, well, the remaining of the bulk of the grants from Proposition 47. Uh, for this particular case, I don't, I think that's something we have to explore further with our accounting folks, but I think it's something we can definitely explore. I certainly, I mean, I just, I would just say that I think it certainly would violate um, the spirit of Proposition 1D, and as I think that that would be a difficult place for me. I, mean, I think it'd be difficult for me to get there on okay. on that. But I, I think we still have the answer to the question and and have it available. It seems like. 
Well, there would also be a, a technical issue in that uh, you would have projects that receive partial funding that would be unable to proceed because they don't have full funding. Uh, 47 wouldn't be available to do the split funding on those projects. They wouldn't be able to sign full and final apportionments on those. Um, so you may have some issue with uh, doing that as well. It could delay getting those projects. I'm, I'm saying use the funding for its purpose, and that was, I mean, if it's a 47, that, that it's only what, you know, what's an LC it's probably 1% of the project cost. So use it for the 1% and the remainder is 1D. Now I understand that that may cause problems, but I I thought, well, let's investigate that. If it's if it's too problematic, then they make the Solomon choice. Correct. And, and I understand your concern. Um, my understanding is there's only 4.6 million and 47 still available. When we apportioned, it showed, when we went down the list in April, or, yeah, in April, we ended right before Baldwin Park, and I thought the list said eight million was remaining. We, oh, okay, thank you. Am I reading it wrong? Okay. Currently, there is an option that the district that is split funded um, can move forward if they choose to, but they are taking a risk because once they receive money, uh, their 18 month time clock does start. Then you're taking a gamble that you may not get that second piece that's on the unfunded list. Um, depending on the amount, you know, if you, it's a district choice. Um, so, you know, what you're proposing, we can go back and further explore. Is a possibility? Just again, it depends on the district's comfort level and, and how much is sitting on that other um, pot that would be and the other thing, too, is I, I did hear this, I don't remember who told me this, but there's also the issue that, you know, construction costs are a little bit on the low side right now, and so that people can pay for their LCPs from within their 1D. That was what I think, I might have even had a letter from a district that to that I didn't effect. think it was an allowable cost. No, that they... Under 1D, you can pay for your LCP program? I did not think it was an allowable cost. So it's allowable, we just don't give the grant. Hmm. <laughs> Okay. Anything else on the bond source switching question? Reimbursement. Just the one oh. thing before you move on, depending on how the board views this, if, um, if we do allow uh, bond source switching, just to have the district that does go from 47 to, to 1D acknowledge it or do something in writing um, and just remind them that they are, it's an allowable expense that they can pay for out of 1D, but they just want, they're giving up the possibility for a grant. If it's not available, that you can do the split funding. So just think about that. Okay. One, reimbursements. I think we already started talking about this one, uh, but basically should reimbursements be, uh, should they have the same type of priority? So it's 150 million. Um, I said, I think we started having that discussion early on, but, uh, well, I do think that gets. To, I mean, to me, it gets that gets to the, it gets to that cash versus shovel ready question. I mean, if you really were thinking about creating jobs, you might say not to not to fund reimbursements. But from my point of view, we're stick. I would say that it falls in the sticking with the the list as much as possible and that includes reimbursement when it comes up it comes up and then you have the benefit of the cash going back into the district you know it starts another construction project in many cases or it repays some other you know loan or fund source and helps the district with its cash situation that's just where I would I would agree a hundred percent with that I think we should look at them um, in the same manner and that they um, in fact they have stimulated the economy on their own dime earlier um, because they're, they can be carrying loan costs to have forwarded those projects. So I would strongly support that they be a part of this um, this new new proposal. But did you want to? 
Go ahead. Ted Rosenkron, I don't know if I school district, just want to say that works. Right now for our district specifically, we have a $30 million high school project that we have two apportionments on the list to receive money for. We, we fully funded that and that's about 50% done. We have a $20 million high school, another high school improvement project that we also have two apportionments to be reimbursed for. We have a $30 million outreach school that's still working its way through CDE and as best they can to get through. We fully funded that. Uh, upon receiving of whatever funding, we have four projects that are currently out to bid. Those projects will either go forward or not go forward depending on when we receive those funding. Uh, that's another $30 million between four smaller elementary school projects. So for us, the reimbursements are the key. Not only, we've already stimulated the economy, and we will continue to stimulate the economy depending on the receipt of the reimbursement. So, and, and let me just say one thing since I'm up here on the bond source switching. As a school district, I never asked you to put in any bond source fund. I was assigned by the BSC, and you know, that's fine. But to go from a switching to have to make any kind of actual promotion, I'm happy to go forward with any funding I receive, and I'll do the best I can. I, I didn't ask 45, 47, 55, money, anything. So for me as a school district, I was assigned, understood, I'm ready to go forward with whatever is in my way. And whatever's on all the cost, we'll make it work. Is that, is that right, Juan? I mean, it's, it's not, we, we, we ask this just that they have a labor compliance program in place. Uh, the reason we ask is because we do, well, for, for a while we had money from Prop 3755, which does offer an additional grant to the bond program. So if the district already has one in place, we would fund it under those bond funds to give them the extra money. If they don't, then we would fund that Prop 1D to reserve the Prop 3755 money for those projects that do have a labor compliance program in place. So no matter what, because of the fund balances you just said, we're going to start running into this where we're mostly going to have 1D remaining and every people, are, if they want to get their programs funded anyway, are going to not get the grant for the LCP, practically. Very and, and from the school district standpoint, we understood that well. We continue to implement the LCP because we want to be eligible for any funding available. Understanding that there may not be a reimbursement at some point in the future, but we want to be eligible for any funding available. So we can fill it in wide and still do it every project we go forward. Go ahead. Hi, Joe Vincent, San Andy, in the High School District. Um, just a couple of points. We're doing LCP as well. Um, we're proud of one day. Uh, on the equitable issue, we have 57 million on the list. We have five projects, ORG projects. Two of those we started already, and uh, we would we would use a reimbursement for emergency repair program projects because we're not getting those funds. And we're already doing 30 million dollars out of our bond emergency repair program projects, and without maintenance funds and other funds coming into the district. Um, our expectation would be that yeah, the reimbursement would come through. Now, if, if the board decided that, hey, if, if you use those rather shovel ready projects, you want to move up some of our modernizations, we could take that too. We like that. But, uh, you know, we would, uh, our, our district would definitely support um, reimbursement as well. Hello, Kyle uh, Smoot, uh, Los Angeles Unified School District. I uh, just want to jump on the bandwagon of funding reimbursements. Obviously, we have a lot of projects that are in the same boat as what you already heard, and we will fund other projects immediately as long as we get the reimbursements. also want to jump on the bandwagon of split funding for LCP since we, we do LCPs for everything with you. So, thank you. I'd be curious, Scott, not to put you on the spot, but put your pure shovel ready hat on. How does that, how do you feel about reimbursements? From what I'm hearing, I'm much more comfortable with reimbursements because they actually are doing the multiplier that I defined, which is construction ready projects that actually create safer schools for kids. I understand the, the multiplier with consultants and engineers. It doesn't create safer schools. So I am more comfortable on the reimbursement than I am on the financial hardship site design issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. All right, so number seven, penalties for false certification. I'm sure this is not a problem for anybody. <laughs> 
way the school districts do certify that they will be able to submit a final lease within 60 days and they don't. Uh, that means that there were some unfortunates, uh, possibly ahead of other districts, and at the end of the day, they don't, meet, they don't fulfill that requirement. Should there be a penalty? One of the things that the board may have at their uh, disposal is uh, an absurd inaccuracy. Uh, that's one option that the board can take if the district doesn't comply, they certify, and they don't meet those uh, obligations. Uh, and there's some other proposals that have been brought to the table too in terms of if they don't, should they be rescinded and go to the back of the line and be unfunded list. Um, there's different ways of asserting these penalties. It's just a question, I think, for the subcommittee first is should there be penalties and then to what extent. Let me lump, now this one is a favorite one of mine because I think people who misrepresent should be punished. I think we should have penalties and I think the apportionment should be rescinded and they should go to the back of the line. I think what school districts uh, would make them comfortable is if they knew the rules so that it wasn't open for determination. I think with this $415 million, if, for example, taking uh, Scott's, what he said, that if districts knew in applying for this program that if they certified that they would come in and get the fund release within whether 60, 90 days and that they didn't, um, the board would automatically know that because OPSC could do that and it could be an administrative trigger that it would just be a rescission of those apportionment of funds and then they go back up the line for the unfunded list and any money left if it was oversubscribed would then come to the board to fund the next ones in line. Here, here's what I'm struggling with. Um, I, I think I, I'm, I'm pretty aligned on the issue of we don't want people um, uh, moving forward that, that are kind of moving on a chance. However, there are circumstances when um, you're precluded from, from proceeding. Um, something happens and it is not, um, it was not intentional. And I don't think the board wants to get into having to make those decisions around that. But things do happen sometimes and it wasn't out of, of um, I think, a beginning malice um, on, on a district's part. So I'm, I'm trying to consider how do we, how do we handle that? Is there a potential of maybe looking at a, a self rescission if they realize they are unable? Is there a timeline or something where then they go come back even after they received the allotted um, apportionment, but before the fund release deadline that they come back to OPSC and then they just go back to the regular place in line? I, but I don't know how the board or OPSC would determine. Chris. Oh. And then I would just say I'm, I'm more inclined towards um, what Mr. Harvey was talking about as opposed to a material inaccuracy. Um, I don't think we want to go down that course, but um, what, what is it that we want to ensure that it, those that are serious are serious and that this isn't, you know, kind of throw your hat in the ring and see if it all works out, um, that it's really actually something that you can perfect and or in a re reimbursement case it's kind of, it's already done. I would note within the material inaccuracy provisions in the statutes, um, it defines it as a funding advantage uh, in one of these, and that's what this would be as a funding advantage, and the board would make the determination on the uh, material inaccuracy. So if there's extenuating circumstances, uh, the board could consider those uh, when determining if a material inaccuracy should be moved forward with. Um, but in this case, uh, we would note that if these districts uh, come in uh, without being able to proceed, uh, that ultimately when the funds are returned, it's just delaying getting those funds out. And I think the goal, what we're working at today, is to get the funds to projects, to reimbursements, uh, for, uh, for school districts to use on capital facilities projects. Uh, just to follow up, is this is a, a one-time $415 million different process. The board can, uh, within material inaccuracy, make a determination for this $415 million that um, if you're unable to turn in your 5005 because you haven't turned in your final 5005, that a, a, an appropriate 
I guess, way to handle it is that because you didn't turn it in, you didn't falsely certify, you're saying, I'm promising I'm going to try and do this. And so what may be the appropriate instead of the MI, which scares every district, um, is the using it as a rescission. You go to the back of the line because they did not certify a final 5005, which then triggers um, material inaccuracy. So the board can make that policy determination. Well, I think I, if I, I was, I just was reading that not very long ago. I think it's not just the question of certification. I think this new process, if you volunteer for this new process, it would be a type of a certification to the board. I'm not, yeah. I, I don't have, this one's prickly for me. I don't really have, uh, anyway, Mr. Duffy, <laughs> help. Madam Chair, members, I'm both you through cash. It, it, it seems to me that if you do this, you, you're being very direct with districts and asking them for something that, that is really finite. Will you move forward in this period of time? And as I said uh, to the board, uh, Mr. Harvey, uh, a few weeks ago, I think 60 days is really too short. I think it should be more like 90 because of what is happening in the field and what we're hearing from districts. But, but nonetheless, Districts, if they identify to you that they're going to do something in a certain time frame, we, we support the idea that they should indeed fulfill that commitment. There should be, however, and, and Ms. Moore, your, your comments uh, I think are important to, to, to reference here, that there should be some means of, because of a challenge at the local level, because of multiple bidders challenging a low bidder is if the district is unable to fill this, that they should be able to come to the board and explain to the board what occurred. And hopefully that would be, you know, in, in a minimal number of circumstances. But, uh, but again, part of what our organization, CASH, does is to try to mitigate the top downing of state agencies that don't know what happens at the local level. <coughs> and at the local level today, there is great angst. So our, our, we, we are committed to working with you to try to look at spending this, this $415 million in a different way. But we would ask that there be some consideration for whatever those difficulties are at the local level. And Mr. Harvey, I'm with you in saying, let's tell districts, money's here, you come in, you tell us, you're going to do this, you do it. But if there's some difficulty, there should be some consideration for an explanation before the board. That, I think that that's the third thing to do. Do you have a recommendation, um, Tom, about how that should work? Um, I, I would think that because this is an experiment, uh, hopefully not a pilot, because we want to change things, but an experiment to help to get money on the street, that if, if maybe it's a form, OPSC likes forms and, and we fill them out. Uh, if there's a form that says if you're going to go beyond the 90 days or whatever it is, 75 days, <clears throat> that you, you fill this out and it would be an automatic appeal before the board. So the board understands what is happening. You know, maybe, maybe it's a simple way of to, to, to do this rather than something that's complicated. So what you're saying is that there could be a circumstance that the board would consider beyond the 90 days. Um, I, I think we're, what I hear is less inclination towards that and more inclination towards there was something that really um, prevented us from moving forward and we don't want to receive a material inaccuracy or go to the back of the line but indeed um, the funding probably should move on to somebody else. Um, I think that if we get into the mode of uh, being the determiner of everyone that passed is the 60 days, then you just open it up to, um, we'll, we'll see how what the tolerance of the board is. Yeah. And I don't think I want to put the, I wouldn't want to put the board in that situation. I, I think one of the things about the experiment is that, and I've, you know, I think I've, I've spent a lot of time with uh, a lot of the people, a lot of the OPSC staff in the room more on this than anything else. And just there's kind of questions of workload. And just if we end up in a situation, all this stuff's going to take intense effort on the part of staff to do this really quickly and to do it well and to not make mistakes and disadvantage districts by their work. And at the same time, I don't want districts to waste this 
waste our time just by applying. And yet, I want everyone to f I want everyone to apply that might possibly be there. This is like there's this tension about is it is it a penalty or is it? I mean, I don't I and I don't want to end up. And the other thing is, I don't want to end up on the agenda, you know, in December. Oh, well, maybe I don't care. We'll do them all in January after. Um, but have the board have to consider a number of appeals and have to go over individual circumstances on this one time only experience experiment. So it's sort of like, how do we strike a balance? And I understand the problem. Dave Walrath, representing the Small School District Association. To harken back to the hardship issue on the site, you may be 90% there, you still have one left. You've made a good faith effort. You have gone through what you would call substantial compliance. On a hardship district on construction, you may go out to bid. Your bid could come in high. You're a hardship district. You know, you're not going to find any more money. You have to go out to rebid again. There should be some sort of way in which you look at that tweener that the district did make a legitimate, substantial effort and will go back out and give them a one-time 30-day. But it's not a case of, you know, thanks for the money, we don't do anything. But they do have to make some sort of uh, time frame, uh, whatever you want to call it, they made certain benchmarks along the way. I'm nervous about the term benchmark. <laughs> but using something like that, and then it, becomes, then it becomes automatic. <laughs> yeah, that becomes an automatic by OPSC saying, yes, you did these benchmarks as approved by the board, therefore you do get the other 30 days, and it doesn't have to go to the board for adjudication case by case by case. Mr. Holman, uh, quick question. Have you heard from small school districts that bids are coming in high? I have not heard from any small school districts that the bids are coming in high. However, if I'm a contractor and I know somebody has to accept a bid in 60 days, I might think of my leverage point a little bit differently than I have it today. Aren't there a lot of contractors out of work? <laughs> You have to find out who still has bonding authority, who can get subs. You may not be able to find all the subs you need. It is not quite that simple. Joe Dixon, Sandia. We uh, we advertise for an emergency repair program project for a PA, new PA system at Santa Ana High School. And typically, you spend in a, a certain type of uh, public gas system. We were challenged, and actually, a conjunction was filed in court to stop the bid opening. Mm -hmm. And so, what that means is we have to go back to the board. I, I, I think that it goes through the whole process again. I think the way to solve it is, as Mr. Effie said, just increase the time, and then you won't have uh, OPSC being you know, burdened with forms or, or whatever comes in or the board. And 75 days should take care of it. 90 days would be great. 60 might be a little better. Are you saying that in the case maybe of a bid protest, let's say, that's a pretty classic um, during, during the contract um, period, that it, if you, that you could solve that within 90 days? Or you said 75 actually, but. My the example that I gave was a little bit different. That was a bid opening. Mm -hmm. we actually, had an injunction filed against us. We had to go through the court process. Um, a, a bid protest, you know, 75, 90 days uh, is, could be tough, but you know, I, I think that's a, a reasonable solution instead of 60. You know, instead of having mm -hmm. forms that you should be able to get through by it. Any other thoughts on this? What? Number eight. <laughs> number eight. Um, okay, number eight, data collection and impact of this one time only special significant event. <laughs> The board did ask us to collect that and see if there's any districts that were could have been harmed. So we do plan on, uh, after this process is over, to do some sort of survey to some districts that um, didn't apply and could have, but sort of evaluate the process and report back to the board. And all on the same note, uh, not, not to jump into the right way, but the communication plan is really no different. I think um, staff does plan on sending out 
uh, email invitations or whatever we do to school districts, uh, possibly a hard copy letter as well. We're even thinking about putting up a sort of a training video online to explain this new process because it does change. The system has been in place for over 10 years. Um, and then we also have our folks to go out to the, the County Office of Education to provide more outreach to notify everybody that uh, a change has been made if the board decides to go in a different route. Okay, any comments on eight or nine? In terms of the data collection, if we could also get data on reimbursements, um, what number of projects are reimbursements, what are projects that are uh, that are going to be undertaken, uh, construction ready, um, I think that might be useful data to know what percentage out there are reimbursements, what percentages are shovel ready projects, since that data is not currently known. And, and why, will that, why would that be helpful? Well, that would be helpful in just determining moving forward, we might be able to say, know what percentage is shovel ready versus know what percentage is reimbursement. Yeah, I just, I, I w I'd like to just, just on that point, I just think that's one of the, one of the things that we've, you know, we've had, when we have these discussions internally about this program, we've had a hard time defining, to be, to be able to say categorically, I've had a hard time saying it to my boss, and then we've in turn had, we've had to discuss it with the state treasurer's office, it's, what is the nature of our list, and we, and it's something we don't know a lot about, and I think that's one thing that, one valuable piece of information we'll just get out of this one time experiment is what what is what what is on our list I, I think I think mr. Duffy's survey helped shed some light on that and I think I think that we'll know more about what our list I think in the future as as we you know as if the PMIA does not return and the PMIB does not function the way it used to in this program we're going to need to have some more know some more specifically about our list just kind of a general comment it doesn't necessarily apply to this one time only experiment um, so back to topic number one this question of regulations um, we didn't really go through the time and I don't specifically like to go to walk through what the process would be so this this timeline just the general process. If the board decides to make uh, to take action at the May board, we would then propose to have a 30 day certification filing period. So that would mean that uh, in June, June 28th, that would be the end for districts to submit their 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 certifications that they will be able to submit a process. In 60 or 90 days, whatever after the apportionment, and then the OPSC review all these requests, and then we will plan on making apportionments at the August board. Now, two typically be the July board, but we would want to have just maybe a week longer process all these applications, these certifications. Um, so we would propose to move the July board to the beginning of August. And then the board will make a portion of it August 4. Then that would trigger the 60 day uh, fund release period. Uh, and that figure could change by that date. But that would start the 60 day fund release period. That, um, and then we would expect to have all the fund releases submitted by October 4th, 2010. So the board will make a portion of it start August 4. And then we would expect to release the funds by the August 4th date. So that's the general process um, in terms of the, the, the option three. And just, yeah, just we, and I, I, we had this, we, as we realized, talked about the scheduling that we knew we'd had these kind of calendar issues. So I have added um, to the index, there will be an item about the schedule for the board meetings. But we, we actually think that the legislative summer recess is in July and it, the members might actually, the legislative members of the state allocation board might appreciate waiting till August to meet. Um, so we have that and then, so, we're kind of looking at the schedule, so that'll be part of the discussion, but I think it makes a lot of sense. And I, I'd really like to hear from Mr. Hancock again. You kind of went into this about the regulation, and you have your, I know on your document you had a chart. I just was kind of curious from your experience what your thinking was on this. 
just thank you, Bruce Hancock, Hancock on the part. Um, I would obviously defer to your, your uh, legal counsel, but in looking at the regulations as they exist today, it appears to us that um, to us, us being our firm, Louis Park, my partner, former executive officer, and um, uh, Chris Long, um, former uh, policy manager in OPSC, that um, the regulations lay out a process now for what we use, what Juan has described, uh, you know, for the last 10 years. And I'm not, uh, I have not been able to figure out how that uh, we get we get around that. Um, if there, uh, if that's the right term, I don't think the board wants to get around anything. But I mean, how do we not address uh, the regulations? I'm, I'm really looking at. Uh, uh, 1859.93 for modernization and 93.1 for new construction. And um, it seems pretty prescriptive. Um, so uh, I'm a, our firm is of the opinion that you really need to address the regulation issue. Um, and, and we do think uh, we lay it out in our, our my hands are on time line, which is probably, probably illegible, that uh, we have full confidence in Ms. Jones that she can get the uh, emergency regulations through the uh, Office of Administrative Law process. And uh, we, uh, we have a slightly different timeline than she has because they've done a good job of a short minute, which may put a little bit more pressure on, but um, I don't really know, obviously no one does, but I would not be surprised if there were challenges um, to this process, and, um, and I would think that the board um, might uh, be able to anticipate that through, you know, some emergency regulations, and it seems to me that the fiscal um, crisis in the state and and the stated objective of the SAB to um, um, get money out into the economy uh, would be a, uh, a basis for an emergency regulation. So. If I may, mm -hmm. did you want to speak to this time I will jump in. Sure. Uh, I would simply reiterate what I said before. I, I am comfortable that staff has laid out a reasonable cause for this uh, board to consider doing it without a regulation, and that would be my preference. At the same time, I would parallel track a regulation on the what I hope is the off chance that someone would challenge it. But to me, the advantages that we've heard about getting the money out, for some of us, shovel ready, uh, in my mind, and uh, the, the short circuiting, the more brief time by not having to do a regulation is compelling. But I think we should do both just to be cautious. If I may, um, Mr. Hancock, if it's if I'm reading your chart correctly, um, in, in the wisdom of the folks you're working with, it, are you saying that regs could be? Um, emergency regs could be enacted by mid-July. Am I reading that correctly? Yes, Which, we thought if the board approved regulations at the May board that it would be possible to have them approved. Uh, in our case, we thought that uh, districts would be submitting uh, resolutions uh, to uh, OPSC and that OPSC would be bringing those resolutions to the July board, August 4th board perhaps. Um, but in that period from uh, the May uh, State Allocation Board to the uh, uh, July-August State Allocation Board, we think that that's enough time uh, to adopt emergency regulations so it can go on a parallel track. Really. So the parallel track would have both the um, completion of the emergency regulations and the apportionments in August. So we'd have regs in place and then apportionments, I, potentially. I think that's possible. I defer, obviously, to Lisa Jones, who knows the process probably better than anybody. But. Okay, we, we looked at that possibility. Um, that is a best case scenario. It's a very best case. Um, <laughs> Where's, where, where's the 
where's the hang up? Is it is it an OAL thing or is it a is it a OPSC? Is it the board? I mean, what? How do we? You say best case. How do we ensure the best case? That's my question. There's a lot of moving parts, and actually, Ms. Jones, describe that. The moving parts. Hi, Lisa Jones, Public School Construction and State Allocation Board staff member. Um, the, reg, the reg process is rather complicated, but let me just give you the Reader's Digest version of it. Um, emergency regulations can happen very quickly, especially if all the cogs in the wheel are greased, such as um, the review process of the fiscal impact statement, which is the 399. That's our biggest. Um, not really obstacle, but that's where we have to show um, a fiscal impact, you know, what the fiscal impact is to the bonds. And in order for that to be sent over to OAL, it has to go through DGS, it has to go through agency, and then ultimately to DOS. So if we could get everybody in concurrence, like a, um, oh, let's say the day uh, before even the meeting, if we could, get a package to the three entities and have everybody do um, a review of it, and the day after the board, then we hand walk through the 399 and get the signatures, then that's part, that's half the battle. The other part of it is, because it's an emergency, Emergency, we would have to do a five-day pre-notice out to all the districts, and this is a requirement by OAL, it's under AB 1302, and you submit um, a notice to all districts saying, hey, we're going to go ahead and do emergency regulations. That five days is part of the 10-day review process that OAL counts as part of their review. If um, any comments are submitted based on that five-day review, they're submitted directly to OAL, and if they are comments that OAL wants the agency, such as us, to review or provide a response to, then they ask us to do so. Um, but this, this could happen if, if we wanted to make it happen. It can happen. Okay. The other thing is on the emergency, you do have to provide, you know, you have to say that an emergency exists and you just can't say, oh, because the state allocation board wants this to happen, you have to provide specific facts and we can do that also. There is, there are facts here that will allow us to do that. Okay. Any okay. questions? Okay. I don't think so. Mr. Duffy. Madam Chair and, and members, uh, Mr. Hancock talked about people challenging potentially. Uh, that could be us, but we will not do that. Uh, <laughs> and everyone else, raise your hand. Your hand. Can you speak into the it's on the record. Into the big is clear. Uh, and, and especially if, if you consider uh, very carefully, I, I, again, Mr. Harvey, uh, school districts that are hardship districts and those that are seeking reimbursements and others. This is an unusual time. But, but let me note that uh, last year, in, in December, well, more than a year ago, to December 2008, when the, the freeze occurred, uh, we uh, spoke to the executive officer at that time and said, we will work with you and we propose emergency regulations to go to the board to keep the program working. And we supported that. The board took action and it happened very quickly. And we, we believe that the board was very wise in doing what it did. Um, so we, we are in support of what you're considering. We think that if you move forward with emergency regulations, the full confidence in, in Ms. <coughs> Ms. Jones and, and how she works. Uh, she's been at this for, I don't know, about, uh, she started when she was about nine. So I think it was about 30 years ago. Uh, <coughs> but we, we think you can do this, so we would ask you to, to, to move forward. And again, we are stepping way out of the realm where we normally are, saying date order. So we're, we're trying to support what we think that uh, Mr. Amos wants to do, what the administration wants to do, trying to, to uh, help the uh, state superintendent public instruction in, in helping school districts. So we, we will work with you to, to that end and, and not, not be an adversary. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm, I'm trying to put this in my mind in terms of simplicity. I'm listening to all these conversations going on, especially here at Mr. Harvey. I'm the simplest one of ever here. I'll sit down now. <laughs> no, I, I'm trying to look at this from the perspective of the simplest way. The simplest way is to simply change, I said that twice, 
change your regulations to require a final release within 90 days. It's very clear from the laws that you have the authority to make that regulation. I'm shorting up the 18-month timeline to a 60 or 90-day timeline. I think personally 90 days would be a better timeline simply because of this and other things. Districts should then be given the opportunity, rather than certifying that they will file a fund release, just to ask for or not ask for an apportionment at whatever board you're going to make these apportionments. I can tell you, if, if you're a district and you're given an opportunity to ask for an apportionment and you know that if you don't make the 60-day timeline that is now a regulation, you're going to be rescinded, your portion is going to be rescinded. You don't need to worry about a material inaccuracy. That simple action of being rescinded at the end of a 60-day timeline going to the end of the line is going to be more than enough uh, impetus, if you will, for a district to ask for a delay in the apportionment rather than a certification of a, of a fund release. And then amongst other things, it does, it also accomplishes an objective that Mr. Hancock was talking about. It reduces your, the opportunity for anyone to come forward and say, you know, you don't have the authority to say that a, a fund release certification is a requirement for apportionment. You do clearly have the authority to say the apportionment will be rescinded if you don't follow that system. I just think it's a simpler way to go. It doesn't put districts in that in that situation. But just but let me ask you this: Does that really? Does that really? Um, does that really control behavior from the standpoint if we're if we're talking here right now with our last 414 million that we have cash lying around we may or may not be able to sell bonds in the fall we may or may not get more cash into the program wouldn't you as a district just roll the dice say you're going to participate in this program see if you can get your act together and do it and then so what if you get rescinded and go to the bottom of the line there's not any more cash left anyway there's a lot of issues that come about from a rescission of an apportionment not the least of which is your appraisals are now out of date you have to reappraise if property values are going down you're going to risk getting less dollars maybe a lot less uh, if you allow the uh, apartment to be rescinded, almost everything you hear about this five and you got an LCP, you may be risking you know, not being funded out of one year or some future bond without that. I think there's a lot of risks that the district does, not to say the least of which is when when it comes to light in our community, if you ask for an apportionment, you couldn't satisfy uh, a fund release requirement, you're going to have local local pressures that are, I, I, I don't think a school district would, would ask for an apportionment if they weren't pretty darn certain they, would, they could do it. And it takes away that problem of, of a material inaccuracy that I think is, is just, you know, a, a way to get more people. This is a good question because I'm confused. Um, I'm a little confused. So you're saying the process being proposed right now is um, a 30-day period to come in and say, I'm going to ask for the fund release. You're saying what vis-a-vis -vis that? Instead of saying, I'm going to, I will ask for fund release, just say, given the conditions of a 60 or 90 day limitation on filing a fund release, I'm asking for a deferral of my portion or I'm asking for it to go forward for a portion. It's a different thing than a certification that you will file. And I think under the law, you have the, you have clear ability to say fund release must be submitted within 60 to 90 days, whatever the number you choose, of a, an apportionment. I think it's less clear that you have the authority to say that a, an apportionment is subject to a certification. How do we create the list of, um, with the 30 days right now, we create the known universe of who would want to um, participate. And we know whether we're oversubscribed or not. And we know where we are vis-a-vis -vis our list or not. Are you saying that go from May to August and just open it up, submit a fund uh, release? You, they would have to submit the same kind of a document, except that it is a, is a document saying, I want an apportionment under the conditions of a 60-day fund release, rather than saying, I certify I will submit it. A fund release as a condition of abortion, but I'm not sure. So you're saying still have the 30-day period. Yes. 
the document is different in that it is the request for the fund release with the condition. It's a request for an apportionment subject to the condition of a 60 day timeline on a fund release. And so instead of then 60 days from then having to submit for within that period, you've already submitted for the fund release? You, no. No. you I'm you, totally you confused. Get an from the day of the apportionment, you understand that you're going to have, you better submit your fund release within 60 days or your apportionment is rescinded. That action creates a lot of problems for the district. It's really, okay, it's, so it's, so right now the way we've kind of been writing this up is we've been saying that you're going to, in the 30 day period, you're going to submit a district resolution or something certifying, certifying that you will um, file your um, 5005 within 60 days. What you're suggesting is that I just say I'm going to ask for an apportionment and then I know that that apportionment is subject to doing it in 60 days. And that makes, and that really makes a difference. Why again? I, I think I understand, but explain it to me one more time. Well, there are two reasons. Number one is it takes away the problem of material inaccuracy, I believe. The second thing is I think you have more justification under the law to say you have a 60 day timeline then and a, a requirement of the district to say that they understand that requirement than you do to say as a condition of a portion you have to certify you will sub submit a fund. Okay, so then at the end of 60 days we have a bunch of rescissions. I'm, let's just yeah. hypothetically, let's say there are some. Then our, and so they get rescissions that when you get a rescission, you automatically go to the bottom of the line, right. and then um, what else? My train of thought. So you, so does that? So would you contemplate that the, these these districts would come in and say to the board, "Well, if I just had 30 more days, or I had more time, I mean, would we end up with in a situation where we would have a stack of appeals on our agenda?" I'm not visualizing it have any more appeals that way than you will under the way you're going. In fact, I, I'm visualizing fewer. Talk to me about material inaccuracy. You said that eliminates the issue. So if you didn't come in within the 60-day period, you're materially inaccurate, are you saying? Well, if you file a certification saying I will file a fund release within 60 days of the apportionment and then you don't make it, you technically cross the line of material inaccuracy. If you just file a document saying I, I, wanted, I would like to have an apportionment, I understand it's subject to a 60-day rescission, I don't think you you have no material inaccuracy because you haven't made a certification. And the 60-day rescission is the project is no longer has status. Right. I mean, the 60 days is rescinded. I mean, you're going to have appeals. I think, regardless of which way you go, I believe you'll have fewer appeals without the material inaccuracy issue. Um, just to follow up as, as Lyle's going along the process, if it is potentially a simple reg change, you can you can lay out the process of a, a district can submit, please uh, consider me as part of the list. I would like to play in the list. And they know that what the reg change would be is um, you could say specifically for the four hundred fifteen million for the financial that these these the following regulation applies that whether it's sixty or ninety days you will submit your full fifty oh five and failure to submit ninety uh, sixty ninety days whatever the board decides shall result in a rescission and going to the back of the line and the board can even say there shall be no appeal process to this and wouldn't a rescission the potential of a rescission in this scenario is is that there's no bond funds left. Correct. They just go to the back of the line and... But we could be uh, beyond authority at that point. Right. I mean, we'd be simply out of bonding authority. We may be back to that other kind of unfunded list. That's right. Yeah. My, my only concern... I wasn't asking you to make versions for more, more money than you have. <laughs> But if you go to the back of the line, Lyle, depending upon when you go to the back of the line, we might be beyond the authority of our bond our bond funds. I mean, there's projections of when our authority is going to run out. So it could, and, and I've heard it as much as early as July. So if you were rescinded after July, you could be at the back of the line that is for a future bond set, a future bond. The, the only, 
again, I, I, knowing what goes on at the local level, there are circumstances, and that's the difficult piece. There, I mean, it's hard to, you know, what is it, the 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 shape from the wheat. Um, it's hard to determine what's a purposeful. I kind of threw my hat in, and oh my gosh, I have a bid protest, and I can't make the days. Um, that's my concern: is the district that goes forward with good intent and to meet the requirements and and somehow something happens that 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 causes them not to versus the district that says oh uh, uh, I probably shouldn't have done that and I'm going to rescind yeah I, I, I actually think there's I mean I I think there are there could be districts that just that that really fully intend to comply and want to do this and think they're ready and something goes wrong like there was the you know the eminent domain situation or any number of things and there's part of me that doesn't feel like having those people penalized but at the same time I want them to get out of line at some point so that other people can take advantage of it what I don't want are are and I'm not being mean to the consultants in the room but I don't want consultants recommending to their clients that they just file the paperwork and and you know just put your paperwork in just to cover your bases and then the district because of all of the things that Mr. Duffy and I have talked about about the problems in districts and the things that are going on at the, in the schools right now that they're never intending to do it that they just file the paperwork to cover their bases that's what I'm trying to avoid and that's the only reason I even wanted to have a penalty discussion but it, I understand your concern. I'll tell you, as a consultant, that's the last thing I would do. I do not ever want to put myself in a position where I ask a district to, to do something that put them in the jeopardy that I'm talking about of our decision. Uh, amongst other things, I'm not going to be a consultant very long. Um, you know, uh, and the, but I think there are other problems. As far as the issue of not quite making it, you know, the double bidding, et cetera, you're going to have to address that in a regulation. Either way you go, you're going to have to say yes or no. The 60 days can be extended if under some set of circumstances. Otherwise, you know, you, you have the same issue either way you go. I'm just talking about simplicity and, and less opportunity to have a legal challenge. How big is the unfunded list again? I forget. I keep forgetting the number. I just keep, my gut tells me, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but my gut tells me we're going to have more than $415 million in applications for this. So. Is that right? I, I would think well, so. Well, I actually saw some shaking. I saw yes and no's. Wow. I, I would note on the $1.3 billion, you would have to include an additional $415 million. It's actually uh, $1.7, if I'm not mistaken, because the $415 million, while you have cash, represents additional projects that are on that list. Got it. Well, for me, I think you both outlined what are cautionary issues. I think this is certainly worth pondering, but I support what you said about this. More importantly, it, it does imply all you're doing is a regulation, and I still would like to have the full board have the opportunity to look at a dual track, that is, looking at doing it without regulation, having some fallback uh, on a regulation. I, I'm not afraid of having the discussion on health and safety. Uh, I'm not afraid of having the discussion on um, shovel ready and to, while it may be more simple we miss those opportunities as well so I'm hoping that we give our colleagues as much opportunity to weigh in on this issue as we've had and that's why I'm comfortable recommending a dual track Cynthia, I don't know how, how where you are on that, but I, I actually, um, given the time frames that we discussed, it looks, and, and if all ducks were in a row, although those are in other agencies' control, um, I think we're best served by moving on a dual track as well. Um, and I would support that. Uh, I, I, we didn't support it at, at the previous board, but we didn't know what the, what the time frames look like. To me, they look pretty parallel, and so 
so why not? I think we should, but I, I, I've got to be the voice of caution. I, I am all for doing things that are within our control. Mm -hmm. And doing it without a regulation is in our control. As Lisa has indicated, you've got to have all these other wheels greased. You've got to assume there are no delays at the uh, Office of Administrative Law relative to why are you doing this. There's no substantial issues. I mean, it, it is a very optimistic time frame. Um, and I'm willing to say we can do it, but again, I, I think if we are interested in expeditiously moving the money out and doing it in a fair way, uh, you serve the board by letting them dual track. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I just, I mean, I. The thing that appeals to me about regulation is, is it it does provide the rules in writing and gives everybody a way to look at them. And we could certainly have the rule. I think, right, Lisa, we can have the regulations. We can make them. We could sunset them, just like we would sunset a statute. Also, providing the notion that this is a one-time only deal. Um, just, you know, it gives us. It does give us something to to look at. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I just don't know what to do about this. I think the thing I'm stumping, stumping on a little bit is the penalty question. But how do you, where? I, I, I'm, I'm, gonna I'm, the, I'm stumbling as well. I, where we want, I think the policy objective is that we want legitimate projects to move forward. And we want districts to consider it thoughtfully and seriously and enter into this program um, when, they're, when they're very sure that they're going to move forward. So how do you in provide the incentive for that or the disincentive to do the opposite of that? That's where I am. I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned about material inaccuracy and I'm concerned a little bit about things do happen at the local level and we ought to be um, cognizant of that and not overly penalty, overly penalize that, um, yet keep within that first time frame. So I'm, I'm struggling with it as well. Um, and if someone has a good idea around it. Um. What, what is the board's view on, let's, let's say that the full SAB approves 90 days, um, or 75 and 90 days, um, and that if you fail to come in by that 75 or 90 days, rescission and back of line, but puts in a caveat that if a district voluntarily um, contacts OPSC, they can give them two weeks before the deadline, you know, um, that they just don't, yeah, whether a 30-day request for extension under certain, you know, timelines that they have to provide documentation if it's a big protest or something like that, or voluntarily um, just rescind and they just go back to their normal place in line on the unfunded list. Not rescind. I mean, they or just voluntarily give up the money and just. Yeah. So, seriously, like, can, show of hands, who thinks we can that we're going to get 415 million in applications for a program like this? And who who doesn't? Gary's got his, Gary doesn't want to be the one raising his hand. But I mean, there's so there's kind of there's a split. I, I just have no way of knowing. I I, don't, I just don't know. Okay, wait. Second question is, uh, those of you who raised your hand, how many work in a school district? So those that raise their hand, knowing your district's going to come in. Fifty-seven million. <laughs> okay, we got fifty-seven million. <laughs> Write it on the chart over there with Maldonado was the floor jockey. Um, okay, well, I don't. I, the, I like the. I mean, I, I sort of the rescission thing appeals to me from the standpoint that it just. It's a pretty tough. It's a pretty tough circumstance, particularly if you get if if you're if you get rescinded. On November 29th, chances are we're out of bond funds. That's a pretty big penalty that you would just not get to be in this program in, in 4755 or 1D. That's a fairly hefty risk. Um, but then I sort of like the idea of being able to voluntarily pull out if you have one of these circumstances. I'm not really so in interested in extensions of time from the standpoint that I think we're, you know, we're creating, you know, bureaucratic things we need to do, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but we have, 
you know, I, I just think we should try to avoid that. So then we have to hit that sweet spot. Is it 60? Is it 75? Is it 90? You know, and I was trying to think, I don't know how this would work exactly. Is there a way to maybe do two rounds? I, I don't know if that would work. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, to do everybody on the same track and have um, regular projects that have that are not financial facility or small school district. So the regular have 75 days, maybe they have 90 or 105, but they still get you know a portion at the same uh, board meeting. But how do we know? I, I mean, I, I think that yeah. can't LAUSD have the same issue as you know Shandon Unified? I mean, isn't it, things that can happen with it with the, these contracts happen in the big districts just as much as the small districts, doesn't it? Or but, but that's where the increase in time, as um, Mr. Dixon indicated, that if it was for regular, if it was 75 or 90 days, that generally takes care of a lot of the big protests and would still allow them time to come in and voluntarily say, hey. Uh, we're not going to make the timeline and jump out of line. I, I, as one board member, would support extension to 90 days. Um, I think 60 is very tight to both bid, go to your board, um, align your contract, um, and, and bring it all home, so to speak. I think 90 is a more doable time frame, and I'm not... I, I, I'm more with you, Cynthia, in treating all districts the same. Uh, I don't want different timelines for different districts. I also think it's administratively kind of tough for staff to administer. So I'm, I'm more inclined to extend the time frame for all and uh, then you know let it take its course. Um, I'm and, 75. Can I go for 80? No, um, just kidding. So, any, are there any other additional comments? Did we raise any issues that people would like to discuss? I just have one. I'm not wanting to prolong it, but as a big, um, I, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, facility hardship. One of the things I believe, and I don't know this. Now that we decided to do regulations, we might be kind of toast in terms of the next agenda meeting, the next meeting. But I, I feel compelled to say that we need to have this facility hardship, the broader facility hardship discussion with the full board. I don't know if, if we can put that in the index and get it done in 10 days. The Silverman's not here, but... My recommendation would be that we proceed forward without a change in facility hardship. I think we need the general discussion, and they're able to participate in the program in the same manner as everyone right. else. I think we know here that facility hardship would be at the top of the list per our usual, our current process when we apportion, I mean, we apport, put them on the list in date order. So we should just add that to our list of things to do, that we need that facility, the broader facility hardship discussion at some point as it pertains to the unfunded list that will remain after this process. Anything else in facility? Is that do we agree on that? It's fine. Okay. Three. On financial hardship. Um, this will be two one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in the sense that um, I, I think I think that I um, I mean I definitely definitely think that the the property acquisition planning cost question and I don't know if this do we is this only yeah I think it's only in this program it's only in this program that definitely they should get funded or in charter schools have that um, capability as well there's a charter project on the list. I don't know if there is. Mm -hmm. Any others? There's environmental hardship uh, site acquisitions. Environmental hardship site acquisitions would be on there. So there's three different parts of programs that may. Now I think, so you're, that's, you're, this is where My only issue is I, I would prefer my definition of shovel ready, construction ready, if you will, not that we're multiplying the economy with consultants and engineers. To me it's building facilities, making schools safer for kids. So I would not uh, apportion site or design as a... So, so I think it's fair in, his, in the subcommittee report to the full board that that we we talk about that split view and and provide the board an opportunity to think about that one and that might be a place in terms of public comment that people want to focus on as 
as that is that questioned. Yeah. Um, That's fair. Thank equitable you. distribution of funds amongst districts. I think we've decided that, that wasn't an issue. Bond source switching. You're going to come up with a. You're going to investigate this question of of Kathleen's point of the splitting um, and using two fund sources, one to pay for LCP and one to pay for bond, and that would again be another one of those issues where there'd be a split of how we feel about that, and that would have to be a discussion item. Although you were a little better towards the end in terms of... I was a little better. I like I like the investigation, but I think that the consensus can be that we will allow we all fund switching. Yes. Right. And that's the consensus piece. The wrinkle is is there a possibility to the split? Yeah. Reimbursements. Um, we're okay. We're all okay. We all agree on that one. I think so now to the thorny penalties for false certification. I think that we. Sh I. I think we're good with going down Mr. Smoot's proposal of if we structure it as shortening this one time only shortening that the hundred the eighteen months to ninety days for this purpose only, then you have a rescission and that's a pretty big penalty. I think we like I think we want to a, a, a voluntary process if you want to withdraw from this program without penalty you could somehow if that's possible. Well that's fine for the regulation but if we're proceeding on a dual track we have to address it on the non-regulatory side as well and my proposal would be if they don't submit that final document they rescind and they go to the back of the line. So I think then we would probably be divided on that, and we should we should because what you described is different. Right. Well, because what she's you talking said about the regulation. I, I but I think that in the regulation, but I don't see how you do what he wants to do. I think. Oh no! I, I think you can write. You can write in if there's a voluntary. Let's say you guys agree 90 days. If do a voluntary decision, like. You have to submit a voluntary rescission by day 16. If so, you I have no problem with that. Your line, your place in line. I have no problem with the voluntary rescission. I would say the voluntary rescission could go up even further. If we're doing it 90 days, I think we've landed on 90 days. Oh, so 75. Why wouldn't anybody that wasn't going to make it voluntarily rescind? <laughs> Otherwise, they go to the back of the line. You just go to your place that you were in line before, not to the back of the line, but wherever you are on the other. Right. So what I'm saying is, anybody that's in danger of not making the 90 days, I mean, why wouldn't they volunteer unless maybe they knew they weren't going to move forward created, with the project? Maybe I just created my nightmare system that <laughs> I think I did. I think I created my own problem. But that was why I was potentially suggesting like a less time because you kind of know you would know at day 60 whether you're. Uh, now I, I, I got myself confused because what I'm trying to get at is I think there could be these bad things that happen and that's not in your control and I'm just trying to allow for that, allow for that but not I'm all, but I'm not trying to create a system where everybody recommends to their clients that they file just go ahead and file and then you can pull it out at day 89 I, I didn't mean to create that I realize I did third mistake state allocation board um, but, <laughs> so somebody help me can you help me <laughs> anybody <laughs> one Chris? oh Chris here comes Chris, Chris. well I just say if you look at the current program if you exceed the 18 months your apportionment is rescinded so if we look at it as a 90 day time frame if you exceed the 90 days your apportionment is rescinded um, so in that regard it's consistent with the current program that we have um, in terms of, of having voluntary rescissions if you allowed for a voluntary rescission there'd be no reason that it, every district wouldn't apply for this and then just voluntarily rescind that's true so the only the only downside of that is the local circumstance that somebody gets themselves that something happens and then they're they're rescinded and they they go to the end of the line. And I understand there's no, there's no if there's no. And I, I would think there is a process already in the regulations uh, for appeals in those unique circumstances for the board to consider. 
So maybe we just go Our back to is to to try and not have or seventy five or seventy five. <laughs> I thought we were up to 80, 80. I just trust what Lyle, was, Lyle said. He doesn't think it's going to happen too much. And so, and we'll just set, schedule all those appeals for the January state allocation board. Good call. I like that. <laughs> Someone else can deal with them. So is there then back to consensus of no voluntary decision? Yes. Yeah. And we'll, we can offer the 60, 75, or 90 days. Well, I guess we should really focus 75. on 75 or 90, the pros and cons on that. And people can com comment, commentators can um, explain to the board why they think one or the other is better. Okay. And data collection. No issues. We know that. No issues. Communication plans. Communications plans. No issues. Any other? Do you think you have enough? Direction here, and then adoption of the time frame that is presented um, with the issue of 90, 75, 90 day outside. I'd like to keep open the ability of the legislative members to say they're going to be here in July because if there is no budget, they are not leaving town. Well, so I think I think this. I think that. Well, I think we're only still, in a week. I know, but I think we're still. Well, more I think staff? that this is really more for OKC staff. Oh, they they're all, not doing squat. This no proves that DGS doesn't really... I don't want to be accused of not recognizing nice. district's concerns. <laughs> and, and just before we formally adjourn, anybody leave their little hard drive thing in the women's bathroom? <laughs> oh, let's open it up. But I, this all is kind of, this all is coming back in May for the right. May yes. State Allocation Board, yes. correct? Yeah. 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 All right. We've lost the room, huh? Quiet. I'd like to adjourn. Thank you. <laughs>